Welcome to another episode of Submission Radio. It's March 22nd, but more importantly, it's our one-year anniversary. Here with Casper Ozalowski, as always. Cass, it's been a year, like a good relationship. It's just flown by. Yeah, I thought you were going to say there's been ups and downs, and I was going to immediately disagree. I don't think there's really been any downs. It's been a crazy year for us here at Submission Radio. Tons and tons of guests. I haven't had the chance to actually count how many, but we've had huge names. We've had huge support from the fans and, of course, from the media as well. And uh, you're right, it's absolutely flown by. Really, really excited to be doing another show. We've got four big guests. We haven't really set anything up like a crazy anniversary, you know, celebration. Yeah. Much yep. like hard workers. We just got our nose down. We're grinding it out. We've got four big guests. We've got Felice Herrig. She's going to be kicking off the show. She's obviously finding Paige Van Zandt, UFC on Fox 15. We've got Jeremy Horn. He's a legend. Lots of good stories. We've got Ricardo Lamas. He's facing Chad Mendes. And then we've got Ronda Rousey, striking coach. I think coach in general, Edmund Traverdian. So he's is going to be a really interesting one man i'm excited absolutely and if you're listening to this show why not put on a party hat and have a slice of cake on us let us know how it tastes because we're working too hard to bring you guys this episode but nevertheless we love doing this for you and we have the best fans in the world cast we're so lucky to have the listeners that we have and the ones that always comment and tweet us and let us know what they think as always guys on twitter at submission aus you can reach us at any time we love chatting to the listeners hearing your opinions and youtube.com forward slash submission ready au in the comment section below put down whatever you want we love having a chat with you guys we, we pride ourselves on having a great relationship with our listeners and we're just so happy that one year down the track and we've got all these amazing relationships that we've built with you guys. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I mean, I love seeing the comments from the fans. And the thing is, we see every single comment oh, on yeah. that YouTube channel. Everything. If, if you're wondering, <laughs> everything. And if you're wondering, it is us responding to all the comments. It's either Dennis or myself. You know, we're not like GSP. We don't have people writing back Twitter comments and things like that. It is us. And, uh, you know, I always appreciate even seeing comments on the little things like the technique of the week or our exclusive video interviews. No matter how big or small, we always see them or we always appreciate them, guys. You know, even if we don't always respond, which I think we do like 90% of the time, but if we don't, we always give it a thumbs up anyway. So we love the feedback, guys. We love your comments. Definitely don't stop. And always hit us up on uh, Twitter as well, Submission AUS. Yeah, that's right. We feel like we're driven by the fans and the show's around thanks to you guys. Don't forget that after we have all those amazing guests that Casper's mentioned, me and Casper get down and dirty and talk about UFC Rio. That's right. We talk about Damien Meyer versus Ryan LaFleur. Didn't like the event, like the event. Here are our opinions. We've got a lot of them. It's a very, very intricate breakdown that I'm excited to do with you, Cass, because I now have a lot of opinions on the card. And even though it wasn't stacked, enough happened for us to weigh in our opinions on. So I'm very excited about that. Yeah, absolutely. Don't forget, guys, as always, you can check us out on Stitcher, iTunes, TuneIn Radio, pretty much any podcasting platform there is. And don't forget, if you do listen on one of those podcasting platforms, give us a rating. Give us how many stars you think we've earned. Let us know. Give us a customer review, whatever they call it on each individual podcast platform. Let us know. We love getting your ratings there as well. Yeah, four or five stars, that's fine. Go ahead and do it. <laughs> we don't it. mind. <laughs> yeah, okay, so guys, you got your, your party hats on, you got your cake ready. All right, we've got the first guest on the line, and she is ready to go. All right, guys, our next guest is a former kickboxer and a current UFC strawweight. She'll be taking on Paige Van Zandt on April 18, 2015 at UFC on Fox 15. You know her from a victor and the ultimate fighter. Ladies and gentlemen, she's none other than Felice Little Bulldog Herrig. Welcome to Submission Radio. How are you, Felice? Hello, I'm good, I'm good. I'm, I'm done with training for the day, so that always makes me happy. <laughs> well, all right, awesome. Let's tell us uh, tell us about that. How was training? How was your training session, and how is the training going for Paige? Uh, training today, Fridays is always really intense. I go in in the morning, uh, I have wrestling, then right after wrestling I do I do pad work with uh, my coach Jeff Curran, and then a couple hours later I go back in and I do strength and conditioning with my strength and conditioning coach. So I'm always kind of, I usually have like two to three training sessions a day. So, um, but I've been in camp, like, I don't really like the term camp because I'm the kind of person who always likes to evolve and get better. And, and I'm, I've been training all year round. I, I always train all year round. Um, after my last fight, I fought on the, the, the ultimate fighter finale, um, December 12th. And, uh, I was right back in the gym like a week later. I, I give myself that cheat week to like do like what I call get fat. <laughs> I 
kitchen, binge and eat. Um, but I was really motivated after the fight. You know, I, I didn't have any injuries or anything. So, uh, you know, I, I knew that I wanted to be right back in the cage again soon. So I, I just got right back to the gym and didn't really miss a beat. And uh, I've been, you know, really consistent, like I said, with, with my training, just always evolving, always getting better. And it, it's not necessarily about, like, the opponent you're fighting. It's, you just always kind of have to be, be ready for everything or anything. So that's why it's important to just kind of train and always keep getting better at, at all elements of MMA. Couldn't agree with you more, Felice. And just on that comment, you mentioned that after the fights, you like to get, you know, fat, inverted commas. Uh, I think we see you walking around pretty much shredded all the time. Uh, I imagine the you getting fat will be, uh, you know, from 9% body fat to 10% body fat. What's a typical, like, get fat meal for Felice Herrig? What, what do you binge on? Um, well, pretty much anything and everything I can. Um, <laughs> I don't really have any, um, uh... I, I don't, I don't really, um, I don't, I don't deny myself of anything. Um, <laughs> uh, Chicago, I'm from Chicago, um, Chicago, Illinois. Um, Deep pan pizza, I, right? Yes, that's, that's my favorite. And we <laughs> make the best deep dish pizza. It's, it's amazing. Um, so that's usually like my go-to meal, but I'm, I'm always traveling. And when I travel for a fight, like, I don't know, obviously I don't have the luxury to, go get a deep dish pizza right after my fight. Um, so I'll usually just binge on sweets, <laughs> like <laughs> cookies, cakes, like anything I can stuff in my mouth. And I have no, um, like, I don't, I don't stop. I don't know when to stop. Like, I really, like, binge. I'm, like, all out. I'm all or nothing. I, my last, the last time I, um, I had my cheat week, I mean, I thought I was fat, but you got to understand, like, it's, you know, I don't like to say fat because then all these girls and, you know, people who are, like, needing to lose weight are like, oh, he, he, he's fat. Oh, well, uh. mm -hmm. I don't think I'm fat. I just, you know, <laughs> when you just were in the best shape of your life and stepped on a scale and you're all shredded and then you eat and then your six pack goes away and you get all puffy. <laughs> mm. Um I did. I don't know if you, because you're in Australia. I don't know if you're familiar with the movie The Goonies. Yeah. But um, I did. Uh, I thought I was really fat, and I did a. I did a video of uh, the the truffle shuffle, and I like lifted up my belly and and got all into yeah. it, and I posted it, feeling like I was really fat, and like you know, I don't know if people are just being nice to me, but all these guys are like, oh, looking good, looking sexy. I'm like, no, I just, this isn't supposed to be a sexy video. It's supposed to be a gross, disgusting video. I'm showing you how fat I am. <laughs> But uh, apparently, it, I, that didn't come across too well. Well, you know, I wish, I wish me and Casper fans like that. Now, while we're on the, <laughs> the subject of eating, on March 16th, he tweeted out, I hate eating in front of people because I'm afraid they might ask me to share. Does this happen often to you, Felice? And are we just talking about strangers approaching you here? <laughs> no, no, strangers don't ask me. Like, uh, Okay, just double I'm checking. <laughs> I hate, no, I hate sharing my food. It's like one of those things, like, I'll buy, like, let's say I order a dessert at a restaurant. If you wanted your own dessert, you better get your own dessert because I'm not sharing. I'll yeah. buy you your own dessert before letting you have, like, a bite of my food. Mm. I'm really, I want to eat everything on my plate. It's, like, it's mine. <laughs> yeah. Um, no, and when you're cutting weight, like, every calorie counts. Like, everything is, like, strictly, like, methodically planned out. And, like, I have, like, I have, like, these organic... Uh, these organic chocolate bars that are made like in Woodstock, Illinois, that kind of local. And I eat one a day, and that's my cheat. And last week, I was at my brother's, and my sister-in-law was like, "Oh, that smells really good. Can I have a bite?" I'm like, "No, you cannot." <laughs> and I'm, it's like I'm so mean, but I'm just I want it all. <laughs> People don't know the backstory for what you go through just to get that one chocolate bar. So we feel you, Felice. You know, before we get to your fight, uh, last weekend, your close friend, Carla Esparza, she had a difficult outing against uh, Joanna, losing her title. What did you think of the fight? You know, it must have been tough to watch for you. Yeah, um, you know, I, I just think that Carla, like, I know after she fought, like, people don't understand how much we went through on, you know, the Ultimate Fighter. So we had to train. We were on the shelf. We had to, like, wait like seven or eight months like we couldn't fight then we were in the house 
you know, we had a fight like Carla fought three times on the show within that was a period of six weeks. Then come home, do all the media for the for the show, then get right back into camp for a five round title fight. And then she didn't really even have time to enjoy like being the champion. It was just like she got the call that she's gotta fight again and be right back into camp and you know, I just think that she didn't I mean, I know, like, she didn't really want to be in there. And I'm not saying that things would or wouldn't have gone differently. I mean, Joanna was, she showed she had some skill. And I've always respected her, you know, her striking. And, but but her takedown defense looks great. She just, you know, you can't take anything away from Joanna. Joanna did great out there. Um, I, I wouldn't say it was the best Carla Spars I've ever seen. But I think it's just because, you know, she wasn't really motivated. But, again, I, I can't speak for her. Um, that's just what, what I gather from, from talking to her. And, um, you know, obviously I, I talked to her, you know, before the fight. I talked to her after the fight. Um, but uh, it was it was sad to see, too, just because, you know, she, she really didn't really get to enjoy being the champion. She didn't have any downtime at all. It was just like... Boom, you won the belt. Okay, boom, you're fighting again to defend your belt. You know, and, and a five-round title fight is, is stressful because you're always fighting the number one contender. You know, so it's not like you really have anywhere to not be 100% dedicated to your training camp. Absolutely. And, you know, me and Casper discussed it on the show last week. We put it down to an off night for Carla. She really didn't quite seem herself. However, some people have been a little down on Carla after her perform- performance. Most notably, uh, Dominic Cruz, we love him, but he mentioned that he thinks Carla needs more men- become more mentally tough. Now, what did you think about those comments and people being a bit down on her now? No, I, I, honestly, I don't, I don't see that at all. Carla is, is actually very mentally strong. Um, just to just to do what she did on the show, I think shows and proves that she's mentally tough. And, you know, not everybody knows how to handle Like, when you go from being a person who's just fighting on, you know, local shows, like getting a little bit of attention here and there, you know, not, but, but all of a sudden get, get getting thrown into where you're on this huge stage for everybody to judge you and critique you and you have to be politically correct with anything and you can't have an opinion and everything you say or do is held under a microscope and actually like I think if anybody needs to be more mentally tough it would be me I I I wouldn't think it would you know be Carla Carla is is the furthest from that I think she's she's one of the strongest people that I know and and again that just goes to show you know how people can be ignorant. Like it, it, you can't really make comments like that when, when you don't really know a person. You, you know what I mean? Like I, I just, I don't, I don't really see why that that statement was made. Yeah. Well, you know, you're one of the most high profile fighters in the division. You know, with the win over Paige, it's very likely that we may see you fight Joanna. What do you think uh, of your advantages over Joanna with your striking background? You know, what would they be, and how would the fight play out? Um, you know, I, I definitely, again, I, I really respect uh, Joanna striking, but I think stylistically I probably would have been a better um, match, you know, against Joanna than somebody like Carla who's, you know, a wrestler who, you know, she can't she can't get somebody down. She, she doesn't, you know, necessarily have an, have an answer for, for Joanna. Um, I mean... It's hard to say. I'm not. I'm not like the the strategy person. I kind of. I leave that up to my coaches. Um, and I, and I really haven't seen. Joanna is just one of the. You know, before Invicta flying out all these girls from overseas, like a lot of us women haven't really had the chance to to study a lot of you know the opponents in the division. Um, and a lot of girls with the, the UFC adding the strawweight division, a lot of girls are coming down. So. Um, it, it, I think it's going to take a while for the division to really develop to actually know somebody's strengths and somebody's weaknesses and, and to kind of figure out where where you're going to fight them. Um, I mean, people always, you know, it's like a striker against a striker, and people are always like, oh, they're going to they're gonna have the striking war. But it, it doesn't always play, and it doesn't always work out that way because sometimes you respect somebody striking too much, and it just, becomes a boring, a boring at fight because nobody's, everybody's afraid to engage, you know. Mm. Um, but uh, I, I don't know. I don't. I don't really think that. I know a lot of people are talking about, uh, you know, oh, if 
if, you know, I beat Cage, then I might be in line for, you know, a title shot. But I, I don't really think that's the case. I think that there's a lot of girls, you know, I, I'm, I'm ranked number eight right now, and I think there's a lot of, you know, other girls I have to get through first to even um, be at that point right now. And and for me, I really don't I don't focus on on that. I just focus on the on the fight in front of me. You know, one one step at a time, one fight at a time, one training session at a time. That's that's really all you can do. Absolutely right. You mentioned focusing on the fight right in front of you. April 18th, you have a highly anticipated fight with Paige Van Zandt. Paige has uh, had a lot of fans' attention since joining the UFC. She signed a Reebok deal. In your opinion, you know, is all this hype warranted? Um, you know, I think people just don't really know. They don't get it. You know, they see Paige coming out and having one good fight, but it wasn't against any one of the girls in the house, and all the girls in the house were the top 16 in the world. You know, she fought another girl who was kind of at her level, so it made it look like, oh, wow, like, such a great fight. But I don't really... I, it, like, if, I I don't care if Paige is getting attention. I think anybody, everybody has to, has to use, you know, market themselves the way they want to market themselves, uh, you know, do what they have to do, you know, draw attention to themselves, get opportunities. But I don't think that... Um, I think that people are soon going to see the the level difference, uh, and, and I think that you know everybody got to see like the girls, you know, in the Ultimate Fighter. They got to see everybody get weeded out, but all people have seen of Cage is this, this one fight, and they think like, oh, she's so good, she's so great, and I'm not taking anything away from her. She's she's a you know good little fighter, but she, I, I think that when when I fight Paige, people are going to see a, a a a difference in levels. I I, I don't. I don't think that this is actually a, an evenly matched up fight at all. Well, tell us about some of the strengths that you see yourself having over Paige. And I will mention, Paige mentioned in an interview recently that she thinks you're predictable. You know, what do you see as some of your advantages over her in this fight? Um, I think the only thing predictable about me is that I can beat her anywhere the fight goes. I know I'm a better striker than her. I know I'm a better grappler than her. I know I'm better on the ground than her. I know I'm physically stronger than her. I know I have more experience than her. I, I don't really think that everybody has a bunch of chance, but um, I definitely wouldn't bet against me in this fight. Um, and that's just, you know, I think she's actually so new and so green to the sport that she really doesn't get it. She doesn't realize that there there is a difference in, in you know, in like what she's got like five, six fights. You know, I've been fighting for 12, 13 years now between kickboxing, boxing, Muay Thai, MMA. I have over 50 fights. I was a world champion Muay Thai fighter. You know, there's honestly, there's nothing that Paige is going to do to me that I haven't seen before or felt before. Um, I, I, I really don't believe she's better than me anywhere. Absolutely. And just a final question on Paige. You know, just a couple of days back, her ex-coach put down some of his feelings about her, saying that she abandoned and betrayed their camp. I, I know that you're a very fair person and, you know, you, you love dealing with people. What are your thoughts on Paige on a personal level, um, dealing with her thus far going into this fight? Uh, you know, there, there is nothing with me and Paige on a personal level. You know, we're going in there to fight and, and put on a show and I don't know Paige as a person, and that and that's one thing that is a pet peeve of mine, where people judge based on perception or social media or rumors. Um, I've, I've been in her spot before to where, you know, I've for a long time I've been that girl that everybody, you know, talks crap about or, or gets jealous of, you know, because of opportunities that have gotten or makes up rumors or, you know, wants to say all these negative things about me. So if I turn around and make things personal against her then you know then I'm a hypocrite and I I honestly like if if she had problems with her old you know with her coaches like that that's for her and her coaches you know I wasn't there I don't know I'm not I'm not Paige I'm not her coach and I I, I can't be I can't be sitting here like passing judgment on her and then honestly like when it comes to a fight it's not like there's nothing personal like I don't take anything for, you know you can't take anything personal in a cage it's not going to it's not going to affect the way I fight. Um, it's, you know, it's not going to affect that, you know, it's a business. Just like when you go into the gym every day, you, you leave your baggage at home. When you go into work every day, you leave your baggage at home. Like, 
you're there, you know, when I'm at the gym, I'm there to train, you know, when you're at work, you're there to work. That, that when I'm in the cage, like that's my work and, and nothing, nothing else really matters. Completely understand. Felice, uh, we told the fans that you were coming on the show and they sent in a whole bunch of fan questions. So we're just going to ask you a few of those, if that's okay. Uh, the first one is from yeah. Mark Zima. His question is, do you have any way to work into official UFC events, any of your famous cosplay for the fans under the conditions of the new Reebok deal? Um, well, my next um, fight outfit is uh, the Reebok deal doesn't go into effect until July. So I do have a very special outfit theme um, planned for my next fight, weigh-ins, everything. And then um, I wasn't there, but my manager, um, my manager also manages Carlos Garza, so he was at the Reebok meeting, which I'm going to have to be at um, my next fight as well. And they said that, they did specifically say that they realize that certain people have, you know, their own style and image and they would, you know, depending on who it is, they might be willing to, to work with that and work around it. So I'm hoping that Reebok sees, you know, like what I bring to the table. I, uh, my last fight was on the Ultimate Fighter, so I had to wear, you know, on the show, I had to wear all the Ultimate Fighter clothes. On mm. the scenario, I had to wear all the Ultimate Fighter clothes. So a lot of the people who didn't follow my career before the UFC have only seen the UFC and haven't really gotten to see all my themes and all my cosplay. And um, I'm hoping that I I can uh, work a, work out a deal with Reebok and and try to incorporate some of my my cosplay and some of my my themes uh, into into my fight. Well, that would be very exciting, a Reebok theme cosplay. Last fan question, because we're running out of time. This one is from a user by the name of Bisexual MMA, believe it or not. He'd like to know if the UFC offered a 105 or a 225 pound division. 125. You, uh, 125, <laughs> sorry. That would be ridiculous. But I'd love to see you fight in it. Would you prefer to fight in, in one of those? So 105 and 125. No, I, I actually think 115 is perfect for me. 110 might be, like, the ideal weight, but they don't have a weight class. I think I would have to cut off an arm to get to 105. I'm already, like, really lean walking around, and I, I think I look big. People always think I'm a lot bigger than I am because I, I have a lot of muscle, but I'm not. Like, on the show, like, on, on The Ultimate Fighter, I was walking around, like, 122, 123, and, like, the best physical shape of, of my life, and... uh Uriah Thayer came in one day, and he was like, and it was like a couple of days before my fight, and he was like, whoa. I'm like, what? He's like, do you have a hard time cutting weight? I'm like, no. Mm -hmm. He's like, oh, you look really big. And I'm like, nah, I'm 122 right now. And, like, he almost, like, didn't believe it. Um, I think I, I look like I'm heavier than I am. So 125 is, like, I usually walk around 125. The heaviest I get is 127, 128. So, uh definitely don't want to fight at 125 and 105 would just be everything would be all about the weight cut so I, I wouldn't really want to do that either yeah absolutely now Felice to finish off the interview we've got something fun for you uh, we do it with all our guests it's called the submission radio tap out round we basically throw a bunch of fun questions at you and you answer with the first thing that comes to mind are you ready Oh, gosh. Yeah, I think. <laughs> all right. All right. No, you're, you're ready. Trust me. Your Twitter is a wealth of knowledge and uh, lots of inspirational quotes. Could you take us into what was going through your mind when you come, came up with this classic line on March 12th? Here's the tweet. I pick my men like I pick my boogers. What does it all mean, Felice? <laughs> <laughs> had a runny nose I just got over being sick and I always am working with word puns and whatever and I just threw that out there to one of the guys at the gym and they're like that's a tweet I'm like yeah should I tweet it so <laughs> I really most of like the, th the random thoughts that come to my head are just like random thoughts like on the spot <laughs> well, it really that... wasn't that meaningful <laughs> it was just a random Dumb there are, joke. There are people out there tattooing it on their arms now, Felice. You have to be careful what you tweet. Now, <laughs> you Instagrammed, <laughs> you Instagrammed re recently. Needless to say, I don't think very many from the WMMA community will be cheering on Mad Brown this weekend. Let's go, Big Rig. Do you think there's any chance the women MMA community could forgive Mad Brown for his comments about women's MMA eventually? Uh, yeah, I think with any with anything, people are like. 
the next big news that hits, like, people forget all about it. Like, I don't, like, I heard he actually did an interview, like, after that, like, talking about how he respects women. I don't know women's MMA. I don't know if that was because he was kind of, he got a lot of crap about posting that. But I think people are pretty forgiving. I mean, people all make mistakes. Like, I I don't hate the guy. You know, I just thought that that was something that was kind of like, hmm. So actually, the reason why I was more upset was because I noticed that Alienware w- was sponsoring him, and Alienware is, like, my main sponsor. Mm. And so I was like, Alienware shouldn't be supporting somebody who made a statement like this, <laughs> you know? But I couldn't say that. So, I <laughs> But, um, like I said, I think that we're all human. We all make mistakes. Sometimes we say things that are taken out of context. Sometimes we're joking about things, like, you never know. Like, I, I I, don't hate the guy. I don't hold a grudge against him. I didn't like his comments, but I don't really know, like, why he said it, like, what was the tone of the interview, you know? Especially when it's a written article, you really never know, like, yeah. who's spinning what. Although uh, his quotes were pretty, oh, I want to see the two girls mud wrestle, like, naked or whatever. <laughs> I, don't know. I don't know if they would quote him if he didn't say that. <laughs> Yeah, I was going to say, another big name in MMA, Fedor, recently said something negative about women's MMA as well. I don't know if you saw the comments, but he basically said that it's not really a sport for women and they should be doing sort of more attractive sports. I I mean, everybody's a Fedor fan. What did you think when you heard that? Well, I actually didn't hear that. But I also think that it might be, you know, like some morals and values are are stricter in, in certain countries too. You know, so he might have even, like, I don't know. I don't know how things are over there in Russia. <laughs> he's Russian, right? I think he's Russian. He, he is technically um, Ukrainian, but, yeah, we'll say Russian, yeah. Oh, all right. I will call him Russian. Like, or, I I don't know. Like, again, like, they're, every country is so different. Like, look at, you know, in, uh, what what's the country where they have to wear, you know, the women, like, can't take that thing off their head. <laughs> the, the hijabs, yeah. You know, what? I'm not too sure. I know, I know, it's in the Middle East, but I'm, I'm not gonna say it's, it's this country. And then, you know, a lot of other people say, oh, it's not actually that country. So, but I know, I know, it's somewhere in the Middle <laughs> right. East. Yeah, I just, I don't know. Um, it's not like, and I'm, like, women, like some people don't like watching women get hit. My uncle, for instance, he's not prejudiced against women's MMA. He loves me. He supports me, but he will not watch me fight. He, he does not like to watch me get hit. Some people just, it it doesn't suit them well, you know? So I can't really, it might, I want to give him the benefit of the doubt and say that it's just because he's a really good guy and he doesn't believe that women should, you know, be treated that way. (laughs) Yeah. You know, I think we've said on the show before that, you know, when when MMA came in, it was a new thing and people were like, oh no, what is this human cockfighting? And everyone's coming around. I think the same thing with women's MMA. People like are a little bit shocked and then, you know, in a few years it'll be, you know, everybody will be jumping on the bandwagon and we definitely hope they do. The next question, Felice, you have lots of awesome fans, but once in a while you post about strange fan messages or interactions. Give us your creepiest (laughs) one thus far. Oh, the creepiest one thus far just happened, and it, it's like a, a story. I did an appearance in um, Pennsylvania, and this guy showed up at Dave & Buster's. He was in line waiting for an autograph. He comes in. He whis- he comes up to me. He whispers in my ear, can we go somewhere and talk? I'm like, no, I got to stay here and do the <laughs> signing. He sits down on a chair for the next three hours, stares at me, doesn't order a drink, nothing, I get a letter in the mail, a piece of fan mail. Didn't know it was from him, um, with a pre a, a Visa card saying, "My daughter, my beautiful daughter, I'm your long lost father. I want to come out and see you. I don't have the finances. Can you put money on this prepaid card?" Whoa! And like he was serious, and I like posted that as creepy message. Then a couple weeks later, I get another message with um, like a, a Buddhist Bible or something or Muslim Bible, and, again, another letter saying, like, I thought it was very rude of you to post that on your page. I still love you. You're my daughter, blah, blah, blah. And then I open up this card, and it's like the pictures fall out of, like, me and him at the at the event, and then just, like, a, a picture of, like, like, I think he wanted me to cut this, like, 
this picture up into like wallet. There was like four pictures on the one page. Like he wanted me, they're like wallet size. He wanted me to like put one in my wallet, put one in a keychain, put one like on my in my locker. I don't know. It was it was kind of creepy. Oh, and then when as soon as he when I was at the Dave and Buster's, as soon as he saw me getting up to leave, he bolts for the front door. Like he was going to barricade me or something. So the manager took me out the back door. It was just weird. Wow. It's weird. <laughs> it, I, I think I saw this guy in a movie once with Whitney Houston, a cold bodyguard. This is unbelievable. We're gonna have to get you. Yeah, we're gonna have to get you, Kevin Costner, or something to um <laughs> to protect you and carry I you have, around. It's unbelievable. I I actually start like I've had like, and you know who knows like sometimes like if people I'm not saying this is true, but you know you always have to be aware. Like I'm always very particular, eerie of people at the gym that are new because I'm like, did you sign up? just to be around me and then you're gonna follow me home like and like you know you never know like especially with all the creepy messages i get creepy fan mail and and i'm not talking bad about my fans i love my fans i get great support positive letters packages whatever but then every once in a while there's this person where you're like whoa you're seriously psycho yeah i need to look out i need to watch out for people like you we, and I've had like soccer type stories even before I was a fighter. So, uh, uh, the, the the things maybe, you, maybe I'll get a bodyguard taking applications. <laughs> the things you go through. See, we'd love to get some crazy stalker messages just to know we're loved. That would really brighten up our day. So, <laughs> just when just when you take those bodyguard uh, applications, you, you better be careful because there'll be some creepy <laughs> ones. The creepy people will figure oh, out a way to become your bodyguard. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe instead of sending posting creepy messages of the day now, maybe I'll send you a hey at a boy message of the day every day. <laughs> yeah, put it. You're put, so awesome. I love you. Put a positive spin on it. Now, Felice, with this next question, you have to be honest with us. All right, are you trying to bring the fanny pack back? I uh, I no, I don't. I don't care if it comes back. I just. <laughs> <laughs> I like it for myself. It's great. I feel like I'm smuggling on an extra carry-on when I travel. It's the greatest thing. I'm like, oh, oh, oh. I got my ID, <laughs> I got my wallet, I got all my money, I got my lip gloss and this one fanny pack, and I got my purse, and I got this suitcase. Boom. <laughs> but I actually, I got it at Victoria's Secret, which is a very nice, Victoria's Secret Sports, which is a very nice high-end store. And it was nice and stretchy. And I thought, oh, this is a fashionable fanny pack. I didn't really realize that once you actually put stuff in it, it's really just a fanny pack. Because <laughs> yeah. it gets all stretched out and whatnot. But it serves a purpose for events. And I'm one of those people who I kind of create my own style anyways. So I'm not really, I wouldn't really say I'm fashionable. I don't go with the fashion trends. I just kind of do what. I wake up and I do what Felice wants to do. <laughs> yeah, I'm is like, there any oh, any yeah, chance right, Felice is gonna any any yeah. chance any chance Felice is gonna rollerblade down to the octagon in her next fight wearing a uh, fanny pack with some of those old '80s sunglasses on? <laughs> you know what? If I did that, I would get injured on the way to the cage. I don't get injured. I don't get injured in like fights and training. I get injured doing stupid shit like running into doors or like keeping my freezer top open and going into the fridge and then hitting my head on the top of the, the door and the freezer. Like, I do dumb stuff. I never get hurt doing anything that you would think I would get hurt doing. It's always the dumb stuff. I would be that person who rollerblades into the octagon and trips. <laughs> um, I was going to say, we saw that you tweeted, today I was asked how I feel about Anderson Silver getting pot for PEDs. Um, it's kind of like when you find out your parents have sex how disappointed were you when you find out? Wait, wait. When I found out my parents had sex? <laughs> well, we don't really when... care about that. <laughs> <laughs> well, more, more, more. Your parents had sex? What? Oh, God. Mind, mind blown. No, how disappointed were you, were you find, uh, when you found out Anderson Silver got popped for PEDs? I don't, honest, I don't remember where I was. I think, I think I saw, I probably saw it on Twitter or Instagram. Everybody finds out all the news now these days on I, I actually don't remember. I have, like, this thing called, like, rapid brain cell loss where I think that fighting is catching up to me now. I can't remember, like, simple little things. 
But I remember, like, my, like, childhood friend's dog's name. Like, I remember dumb, trivial stuff like that. Like, I don't... <laughs> the important things, that's what matters. The interview just took a serious turn. Police, is this, <laughs> is this a recent thing? Because of fighting? Have you always had it? I don't know. That's the thing. I, I, I honestly think You don't that remember. <laughs> no, I don't. And I wish I could remember. So now, um, because I don't remember, I don't know which it is. <laughs> or maybe it's because I'm getting older. I don't know. But I, you know what? The thing is, I've always been a brawler, especially when I fight, like, I fought kickboxing and boxing. I would take so many shots to the head and not care. I'd be like, oh, you hit me once. Okay, I'm going to come back 10 times. But I would stay in the pocket and I would let people hit me because, honestly, like, I didn't care. It didn't affect me. It didn't hurt me. And now I'm like, oh, is this catching up to me? Now I don't want to get hit so much. I'm like, damn. I feel, I, I like, can I can feel my brain cells falling out every time I get hit now. Like, yeah. <laughs> you don't want to start sandy punching. God forbid. You don't want to forget that you did this interview because we would, we would be truly heartbroken. Finally, Felice, give us the official prediction. How are you beating Paige Van Zandt at UFC on Fox 15? I really think I'm going to knock her out in round one or round two. All right. Well, we can't. punch this KO, KO, I don't know, but I don't see the fight going all the way. And I definitely see it being stopped, whether it's by the ref or she or the doctor or her, I don't even know if her corn is allowed to throw in the towel anymore but she, <laughs> she, it's not going 15 minutes I will tell you that well we're excited ready we can't wait to watch guys UFC on Fox 15 April 18th it's a really really stacked card of course Luke Rockhold and Machida are in the main event and you can follow Felice on Twitter at Felice Herrig make sure to stay tuned guys uh, Felice it's been an absolute pleasure having you on the show Thank you. It was actually one of my best interviews ever. Not because of me talking, but because <laughs> you guys were fun. This is Ben Killaby Saunders, and you're listening to Submission Radio. To say our next guest is an MMA veteran would be a gross understatement. With 117 fights, 91 wins, he has been across the UFC Pride, IFL, WEC, Bellator, and has battled Chael Sonnen, Chuck Liddell, Anderson Silva, Forrest Griffin, Randy Couture, Dan Saverin, just to name a few. It is our absolute pleasure to welcome MMA legend Mr. Jeremy Horn to Submission Radio. Welcome to the show, Jeremy. Thanks for having me on, guys. Oh, the pleasure is all ours. Now, Jeremy, for the listeners who don't know, you started MMA in 1996. That's almost 20 years ago. Did you ever envision you'd still be in the sport in 2015 when you had your debut fight on March 1st in 96? Well, you know, I, I didn't really uh, think much about whether or not I'd still be fighting, but I always knew that I'd be involved with MMA until the day I die. So. <laughs> Absolutely. Now, 170 fights. Looking at your record is just amazing. For listeners who don't really understand how often you fought, I just want to bring up something in this interview. Just a quick time period for a second. Now, I'm going to go back to 1998 here, Jeremy. On the 6th of November 1998, you fought Derek Ruffin for SFC in Illinois with a win via rear naked choke. Now, on the 7th of November, the following day, you fought for Hook and Shoot in Indiana and beat Jerome Smith by first round armbar. And then casually, six days later at Gladiators 1 in Iowa, you beat Rich Nettleton by rear naked choke in the first round. And you did all these types of stretches over and over in your career. That's just absolutely crazy. Tell us about those times. What was it like being Jeremy Horn riding from state to state, back to back, beating everyone in the first round? Um, well, you know, I, I I was just doing what I love to do. You know, I didn't really think about it back then much. I just, the sport was pretty new and and uh, we were all having fun. So there really wasn't a whole lot to think about, you know, just fly in and there's some guy across the ring for you to fight. <laughs> Wow. And we heard a lot of the times when you fought, it was because you fought for your friends' promotions and fighters would fall out. Is that true? Yeah. Yeah, that was pretty regular. You know, back then, everybody was fighting as, as much as everybody was was uh, promoting fights. So, you know, I mean, it, it wasn't as regulated as it is now. So if you could get 10 people that wanted to fight each other, you had five fights. Um, so it was, it was quite a bit more common for, for fights to be going on you know, literally in, in, you know, Uncle Bob's garage because he owns a, a car dealership and he's got room for, for a, you know, a wrestling mat or something. Wow. So, yeah, that kind of stuff happens a lot more often. You just run around, go wherever you're going, and, uh, and jump in and get it done. 
It's it's a crazy sort of situation because I, I mean MMA fans now MMA has grown into this mainstream sport and you you used to seeing a lot of big fighters just fighting once or twice a year so for them to hear you know a guy like yourself fighting almost the next day across America or across the world it's just unbelievable what what was it like mentally for you because you're going from town to town fighting these guys. A lot of them, you probably don't even know who they are because this is back in the day when you didn't really have tape or YouTube to look at them. What was going through your mind? Oh, Were you just yeah. sort of going into it like, all right, I'm just going to show up and whatever's across the ring for me is what's going to happen? Yeah, yeah, that was pretty much it. I mean, like you said, there was no, the sport was so new that uh, that nobody really knew what was going on and everybody was willing to just fight and, and that's really all there was to it. Um, you know, a lot of times it was just, you know, hey, I'm going to show up and then the promoter will match up. You know, whoever happens to be close to my weight will get matched up. And that's kind of how everybody was, you know. Yeah, Jeremy, the other thing, obviously, mentally to be tough. What about physically? Like, um, first of all, I want to know, did you plan on having back-to-back -back fights? Or was it something where you got a call the next day and you're like, sure, I'll fight. And if you did plan to have them back-to-back, you know, were you ever... Did it ever, ever cross your mind, like, damn, I might be in a three-round war. I might get really beat up. How am I going to compete the next day? Uh, well, I, you know, uh, a little of both. Sometimes I'd plan them. Sometimes I would just get a call the morning of, and if it was close enough for me to get there that night, then I would jump into the car and go and fight. Uh, but as far as, you know, thinking about the, the potential of getting hurt, I mean, that, you know, you, you, nobody really thought about that. I never got hurt, so it was never really on my mind that I, that it could happen. You know, I suppose had I ever gotten badly banged up in a fight, then certainly I would have started guessing in the future going, hey, this is, you know, but kind of out of sight, out of mind. If you're not getting hurt, why would you think about getting hurt? <laughs> mm -mm. It's almost it's almost um, the opposite of what happens now, Jeremy. Fighters might fight twice a year, sometimes even less. Do you think uh, in a lot of ways back in those days where you'd be able to have sort of more back-to-back -back fights really cut your teeth, in the industry, it might have been a little, a little bit better for a lot of fighters because a lot of fighters, it seems like, have a lot of ring rust, have trouble getting in there, and their records aren't very high by the time they finish their career. Yeah, you know, there's there's a lot of good and bad to that. Um, yes, certainly it gets you more mentally accustomed to fighting, um, but with the, the level of skill that's in the sport today, it's certainly hard to fight at that level um, repeatedly. A big part of the problem is now because it's become – uh, you know, so mainstream and so popular, um, you know, the, the style of fighting has, has changed, uh, you know, in that everybody wants to be exciting, which basically means everybody is just standing on their feet and, and swinging haymakers at each other. Back then, I mean, even guys that wanted to do that, you know, somebody was going to grab them and take them down because everybody was either fighting, you know, kind of on instinct and, and somewhat fear, uh, you know, because they have no idea what's going on. Or they're grapplers, and they're trying to take everybody down. So, you know, nowadays people are more well-rounded, and they're seeking, you know, to, to please a crowd. Um, so whether it's in their best interest or not, they're standing up and swinging for the fences every chance they get. And that does not make it easy to fight back-to-back -back fights. Absolutely. Now, the other the other side of the coin is there's a lot more at stake because obviously the pay is better. You know, there's TV deals. You, you're on pay per view. You're talking about sponsors and pay per view points and stuff like that. You do also get the side of fighters where you know you got to win by any cost. And sometimes you see those decisions that fans you know that are a little bit opposing to. Yeah, in general, there's just more risk. What do you think about fighters sort of playing the safe route in those fights? Well, again, you know, I can't blame them when your career is on the line and there's a lot of money on the line. Uh, you know, you got to do what's smart for your career. Uh, but back then, you know, that just really wasn't a concern of mine. I wasn't fighting as a career, mm. even though that's kind of what it, it morphed into. I was fighting because I love to fight. So, and I mean, I still love to fight. That's why I'm still doing it. But, um, but yeah, I mean, it, it's a lot different when, you know, you're going to make enough money to live, you know, for the next few months uh, or – potentially you're going to be broken and hurt and get cut and you know and, and your whole life path changes back then i was making like two or three hundred dollars a fight i didn't care so i so i miss a fight big deal there's another one next week you know mm. but again never really thought about getting hurt because i was never hurt so and i'm also curious jeremy you know during that time obviously you seem to have the freedom to take a lot of fights in a short amount of time and seemingly whenever you wanted what you know you said it wasn't your career what were you doing at that time you know other than fighting sort of as a regular job did you have a regular job at the time 
Well, uh, to say it wasn't my career, I guess, is a little misleading. Because, yes, it was my career. But I didn't think about it like a career. I was just doing what I love to do. You know, when I when I first moved to Iowa, um, I, I originally lived in Omaha, Nebraska. And when I decided to move to Iowa to train with Pat Militich and the guys, it, uh, it, it just so happened that there, was, uh, there were fights everywhere. So when I moved there, I didn't have to get a job because there's a fight every single weekend. And if I just kept fighting, then somehow the bills stayed paid. So, I, you know, I never really had to think about getting a job. But I also never really thought about fighting as a career. It just seemed like I was doing what I loved, and somehow there was money to pay the bills. So I didn't even think about it. Iowa, the fighting state. And we'll have to have a chat with you about the military camp a little bit later in the interview. I just want to jump to a date, a big date for a lot of MMA fans, March 5th, 1999. You beat a... Not very well-known guy by the name of Chuck Liddell via triangle choke, uh-huh. giving him his first and only submission loss. Facing Chuck back then, did you realize he'd be one of the biggest stars in MMA? No, I certainly didn't. Again, you know, the sport was starting to grow, getting a little bit more recognition, but he was just another guy across the ring from me. Now, you ended up losing the rematch to Chuck in 2005, Did but obviously you hung in there until the fourth round. Did a part of you ever wish that you guys had a had to have a rubber a rubber match before you retire from the sport uh no not particularly i mean i don't i don't really care too much for rematches and i don't really think about them too much you know i just i want to fight whoever's across from me so i mean if it's a rematch great if it's not great i you know but i don't seek out rematches i don't care it's interesting because when looking through your record a lot of fans We'll see a lot of familiar names. Some of the best guys, like we mentioned in the introduction, you had wars, you know, with some of the biggest and pound for pound best fighters in the world. Was it sort of funny to you that a lot of them fought you before they went on to become, you know, well known fighters and you didn't really get a chance to really know who these guys were or how great they'd be before you, you know, fought them and a lot of times beat them? Um, you know, again, never really thought about it back then. Just that's the guy crossing the ring from me. But just looking back at it now, like, do you do you ever look at it and just think, like, damn, I've thought so many like big names, and a lot of them I've beaten. Sure. Well, you're currently riding a four fight win streak. You know the UFC is bigger now than ever before. Is there part of you that wants to have one last run in the UFC and make one last play for the title before you finish out your career? Ah, uh, no. I you know I've never really cared much about titles. I've got a, you know a giant bucket of belts, uh, you know, collecting <laughs> dust in my closet. Hmm. Um, you know, I just like to fight. Right now, I mean, I'm focusing a lot on trying to trying to build the gym, and I'm trying to train other guys. I still fight because I enjoy fighting, but uh, you know, I, I don't really care if I get back to the UFC. Uh, you know, I stay pretty busy with with the things from the gym, so I don't even know if my schedule would allow me to train the way I would need to train to really fight at that level again. Uh, right now, you know, I get a lot of training in just by training the guys at the gym. You know, I'm rolling with guys every day at a variety of levels. I'm sparring with guys every day. So, I mean, I stay reasonably sharp, but fighting at that level, you know, to, to compete in the UFC, that, that's another level. And uh, I would have to go, you know, I'd have to completely start over and uh, start training again, and uh, and the gym would get neglected a lot. Well, you mentioned moving to Iowa and joining a camp, which was one of the toughest camps the Miltich camp, Pat and Jens were on our show previously. They discussed it with us as well. You know, what was it like being a part of a camp full of champions and future champions such as Robbie Lawler, Matt Hughes, and Tim Sylvia? And for a long time, you guys had a lot of the pound-for-pound best fighters in the sport in your camp training together. You know, it's it's hard to say. Uh, you know, it's just back then we were just a bunch of tough guys training together, having fun, doing what we like to do. You know, it wasn't really a matter of, you know, hey, this is a room full of champions. Even when it became a room full of champions, nobody really thought of it that way. Nobody really, you know, like you were a champion when you were at the UFC. When you come back to Iowa, you're just Jens. You know, you're just Matt Hughes. Nobody cares. You know, and they didn't care either. I mean, the belt went on a shelf in their uh, in their living room somewhere, and then they came back to the gym and just jumped back into practice and started training like everybody else. There was really no, you know... I'm the champ, so I'm somebody special. It's just, we're just doing what we love to do. Now, you mentioned tough, and I think that's a really appropriate word. We've heard the crazy stories about sparring day. We spoke to Pat and Jens. Can you tell us a bit, what was it like when you when you woke up that day knowing it was sparring day at uh, the Miltage camp? 
you know, when I was back there, it, it wasn't as rough as uh, as it was after I left. It got a lot rougher later on, so I never really had to deal with that much. I mean, it was you know, it was reasonably rough, but I mean, guys getting knocked out left and right. I mean, that 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 surfaced after I I already moved to Utah. You mentioned obviously your great new gym, Elite Performance Gym. What what kind of stuff did you take over from you know the success of the Militich camp and brought it into your own gym now that you're running your own gym and your own camps for a lot of local fighters? Well, honestly, mostly the the biggest thing that uh, that I've always tried to adhere to and and that I brought with me is just adherence to technique. You know, whether you're standing on your feet to to fight or you are on the ground grappling with somebody, technique is what wins. So I don't want to see guys closing their eyes and swinging hard. You know, you better have your chin down and be throwing clean punches. If you're going to take somebody down, you're not allowed to just sit in their guard and punch them in the ribs. You know, you need to know how to grapple. If you want to take somebody down, you better be able to pass their guard, mount them, you know, hurt them, make them turn over, make them make mistakes, you know, whatever the case may be. But, you know, technique is what wins, and it always has and it always will. You know, uh, superior athletes will, will come and go, but if they don't have the technique, to uh, you know, to to, to really, um, that's what I'm looking for. If they don't have the technique to really uh, uh, back up their their athleticism. Somebody's going to beat them sooner or later. Somebody with better technique will beat them. Absolutely right. And I mean, for a lot of your career, a lot of your wins have come from really good technique on the ground. A lot of stuff that you do really well. What do you? What's your thoughts on this whole? Obviously, back in the day when the sport was still young, everyone was training really hard, sparring every day. You know, a lot of people got hurt during training. Now that the sport is more mainstream and there's longevity in the sport for all athletes, guys like Robbie Lawler, who used to train with Militage, now talk about training smart over training hard. What are your thoughts on training smart over training hard? Is that something that you think is important for a lot of these athletes now looking to have a long career in MMA? Absolutely. That's, that's always been my take from the beginning, you know, along with focusing on technique means being smart. I'm not going to stand there and brawl like an idiot in sparring just to prove I'm tough. We don't have to go super hard contact. We can go light. And if I touch you, just assume that I hurt you. React as if I hurt you. Move as if I hurt you. You know? Um... You know, and every now and then it's good to go hard and get some work in, but no, nah, you don't have to go super hard if you're focusing on good technique. Yeah, it's very smart. Now, Jeremy, one of your battles, uh, one of your famous battles was against Anderson Silver in 2004. You know, I just want to get your thoughts. What did you think when you found out that he had tested positive for steroids recently, and were you shocked like the rest of the MMA community? Um, honestly, man, I my, my view on steroids is a little different than most. I, I don't care. I don't think it changes much. I don't think it affects much. I'm certainly it's, uh, you know, you're bigger and stronger or whatever. I don't care. Techn- like I said before, technique wins fights. It's, it's actually an, don't give you good technique. It's an interesting one. Do you think, obviously, a guy like yourself, you've got an amazing legacy behind you. Do you think it hurts Anderson's legacy in a lot of fans' eyes around the world? I, I You know, I imagine it does, but I don't think it should. Uh, you know, just because... You know, I mean, there's there, he's done so many amazing things that uh, that you know were not the, the not because he was bigger or stronger than his opponent, or or you know, and, and the biggest thing is people will say, well, it's not about being big and strong. Taking storage means you can recover faster, which means you can train harder and more. Well, that's only if you're pushing the the extreme physical side of things. You know, you're telling me you can't sit down and watch tape and learn. You can't loosely, slowly drill stuff and learn. You know, it, it's it's only how hard can you push, how how physically demanding. You know, uh, you can you can push yourself. You know. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, so I mean, it's it's sad that that uh, that it, it may hurt his legacy a little bit because I don't I don't think it should. You know. I've just got one more question, you know, in regards to PEDs. Like, we spoke before about how the stakes are higher now and there's more money in the sport and things like that. Do you think that with do you think that PEDs have been around in the sport always, or do you think because of the prizes now, they're becoming worse? Well, I think they've always been around. They're, they're getting bigger now, obviously, because, uh, you know, it, it's there, there's more, uh, uh, you know, there, there's more uh, money in it. But uh, they've always been around. You know, back then they were they were very very common because people didn't really they didn't really you know know good technique as much as they do now. So they were seeking something to find an advantage. So 
strength and power and speed was the advantage. So, you know, got to get on steroids. But now, you know, people are still looking for an advantage. And really the only advantage is, is get smarter, get, get better, get more technical, you know. It's interesting, Jeremy, because obviously when you speak about the technique, it sounds like you speak from personal experience. I mean, you've had 117 fights, and back in the day when there wasn't really any testing whatsoever, did you ever have any moments when you had opponents, and without naming any names, when you had opponents, when you were looking across from the ring at him, and you were a little bit suspicious, maybe this guy is using PEDs and steroids, and is, are your thoughts on steroids basically because you beat a lot of those guys with your technique? Um, you know, I never really thought about it, you know, seeing somebody crossing the ring for me and thinking, man, this guy's on steroids. Um, because again, it just, it wasn't a concern. I don't care. Yeah. I mean, I would look at guys and go, damn, that guy's big. I bet you he's really strong, but like, whatever. He's not as good as me. You know, as long as I don't stand in front of him and brawl like an idiot and run into that haymaker he's throwing at me, then I don't have a problem. I'm going to take him down and beat him, you know? Sure. Now you're returning to the ring against, or sorry, to the cage against Tony Lopez at Sugar Creek Showdown, March 28th. What do you see as your advantage over Tony? And give us a prediction on how you're planning on beating him. Um, I mean, my advantage obviously is that I've been doing this for you know almost 30 years. Uh, there's nothing he's going to do that I haven't seen, um, and I'm better than him. You know, again, I mean, technique is king. I, you know, I've fought some of the best in the sport. And, uh, you know, beat some and then lost close fights to others. He's not better than me. So I'm going to be able to beat him because I'm better than him, you know. And, you know, luck is always a factor that I can always, I can always play into it. But, you know, if you don't fight stupid and reckless, you can minimize how much luck is a factor. And I always fight, you know, uh, with, with, a, with a mentality of minimizing, you know, luck or bad luck in, in, any, in any case. Um, so I don't, I don't see him being a problem. I'm going to beat him with whatever he gives me first. Absolutely, Jeremy. We have some uh, fan questions for you coming up in the interview. Just before we jump to those fan questions, do you? Th we, we spoke about you obviously making one last run, and you said you're not really interested. You're focusing on the gym. Do you ever foresee yourself in the future before you retire having one last run or getting the motivation to have one last run in other companies like Bellator or the UFC? Or was it just a case you've accomplished so much, you've done so much for the sport, you're just happy growing other fighters in your gym now? Well, a little bit of both. I mean, if, if my schedule and, and my situation were to change to a point where the gym didn't need as much attention from me. Um, it could kind of run itself on its own, or I had a had a real strong staff of people that I could rely on. And yeah, maybe maybe I could step away from the gym a little bit and try to focus a little bit more on on myself, and maybe uh, maybe make another run uh, at something bigger. But uh, only because it would be you know it'd be fun to do it, not because of any any desire that I that I feel left inside of me you know i mean i do what i do because i like to do it and i've never really cared much about um you know winning titles or, or doing that kind of thing i mean I, I love to win a fight and i don't i don't really care if uh if that fight is is in the ufc or if that fight is you know in in, in my backyard against my buddy you know <laughs> sure also, I just wanted to ask you, you know, in regards to your, t your opponent, Tony Lopez, I know, Jeremy, you came, obviously, from a time where the rules were still being made in MMA, and, you know, they've sort of become what they are today. You know, Tony sort of has a history of uh, having a few incidents where he's basically uh, either held onto chokes or, you know, hit his opponent after the after the fight's been finished. I'm just wondering what you think about that. Uh, I'm sorry, I, I misunderstood you a little bit. You said he's had a history of doing that? Correct, yep. It happened in August of 2013. Uh, really? Yeah, I'd have to look into that. I didn't really know that. Um, I am not a very big fan of that kind of stuff. You know, I mean, depending on the circumstances, sometimes that kind of thing just, it happens. Uh, but, I mean, if it's like blatant things, kind of like what Paul Daly did with Kai Chang, that type of thing, it's going to be a real bad night for him because I don't, I don't like that. Tell you what, it's going to be an exciting matchup. Now, we've got some fan questions for you. First question is from Joey Jojo. He'd like to know, which opponent would you consider your toughest fight? Or which opponents would you consider your toughest fights if it's tough for you to narrow down one name out of that 117 fights that you had? Yeah, uh, you know, it, it's pretty hard to pick just one. I mean, obviously, Chuck Liddell's got to be up there. I mean, that guy's a, that guy's a legend in the sport. And uh, our second fight was, obviously, everybody saw it. That was, that was really, really hard. 
But, uh, you know, I don't know if I could pick just one. Um, you know, I've had a lot of tough fights, fought a lot of tough people. Now, the MMA professor wants to know, his question is, you've accomplished so much MMA and fought the best of the best. However, you are reaching 40. Have you thought about retirement from the sport, and how much longer can you see yourself competing in MMA? You know, that's, that's actually an interesting question. Um, as far as retiring goes, I mean, you know, what, what person wants to stop doing what they love? You know, as long as they're physically capable of doing it, you want to keep doing it. Mm. So, I mean, I don't really know when I'd retire. But at the same time, you know, I don't, I don't want to uh, just kind of fizzle out and, and finish fighting, you know, people that are like well below my level. And, you know, I mean, you know, I, I don't want to be the high school kid that's going back to kindergarten and picking fights, you know? Yeah. Uh, you know, I need to still be fighting people that are, that, that are, uh, a challenge. Um, so, I mean, as far as retiring goes, I, I don't, I don't see any foreseeable end. I mean, I'm sure I will eventually just kind of say, okay, I guess I've done enough and move on. I don't, uh, I don't see myself making a big, you know, a big show of, of uh, retiring. Last fan question comes from Ryan Randy. He'd like to know how many injuries and surgeries have you had been in the game for such a long time? And he'd also like to know about any memorable gym wars that you may have seen or been a part of during your time in MMA. Uh, you know, I've never really, never really been part of any big or seen any big gym wars. I mean, obviously lots of guys training hard and lots of guys working hard, but, uh, you know, never really, uh, never really saw that kind of thing again, because I've always tried to promote and encourage everybody to, train with as much technique as possible. So, you know, never wanted to see guys going to war in the gym. I think that's kind of silly. You know, you've only got, you know, your body and your mind only have so many wars in you. So if you're going to waste those in the gym, you don't have them for the fights when they matter. Uh, but, uh, you know, as far as, um, you know, hard sparring sessions, I've, you know, I've seen quite a few, obviously the guys back in the day in Iowa were, were real tough and then pushed each other real hard. Uh, what was the other half of that question? How many injuries and surgeries have you had been in the game for such a long time? None. I have had zero injuries. Are you kidding? Injuries. No way. Yeah. Seriously, never, never I, any. I, what about well, minor I take stuff? That back. Nothing, Not, minor. nothing major. Okay. Um, in my fight with Anderson Silva, uh, in about ten seconds into the first round, when I tried taking him down, I pulled a groin muscle real bad. Wow. So and that's you why, would, if you, you see would the rest of that fight, I end up kind of limping around, limping around like Frankenstein. <laughs> um, so yeah, I mean, I guess that was the injury, but, uh, and as far as surgery goes, uh, I've never had any surgery. I got a couple of stitches on my forehead once because I was training and I, uh, I shot a takedown on a guy and my head hit a metal bracket on our cage and, uh, <laughs> split me open pretty bad, but I've never had any surgery, never broken any bones. Um, you know, pulling my groin muscle with Anderson Silva was by far the worst thing I've ever done. Coming in second place to that is probably a black eye. That's unbelievable. In 170 <laughs> fights, look, guys, the worst injury that he's ever had is a pulled groin muscle. Me and Casper get our groin muscle pulled just by getting up off the couch. Absolutely yeah. amazing and fascinating there, Jeremy. I feel like because recently we, we, we had the cage banned in uh, in Melbourne of Victorian Australia. The cage is now legal. You obviously will be doing a show here and all that kind of stuff. But obviously the politicians were fighting hard to keep it banned. I feel like you were the poster child who should have just flown you in, Jeremy, and been like, look at this man, 117 fights, and the worst that he's had is a pulled groin and a, and, and a black eye. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's uh, The cage, I think, is, uh, you know, I mean, strategically it can be bad because guys get pinned against it and... Uh, you know, they can end up losing a fight. But in terms of safety, it's so much better than the ring. Um, you know, you're not going to fall out of it. You're not going to fall out of the cage. That's just all there is to it. Oh, so, absolutely. Uh, like I said, the, da the downside is that, you know, strategically a good wrestler can take you down and pin you against it, that kind of stuff. But in terms of safety, uh, the cage as a beat, hands down. Yeah. And well, the politicians came to the senses, and it is legal now, which is great. Now, Jeremy, to round off this interview, uh, we're going to do something fun with you. It's called the Submission Radio Tap Out Round. We basically throw a bunch of fun questions at you, and you answer with the first thing that comes to mind. Are you ready? Uh, I'll give it my best shot. All right, cool. Now, really simple. You fought all around the world. Give us your favorite company to fight for and why. Uh, boy, that's a tough one. I don't know if I could say um, maybe Pride. Uh because just the, the show that they put on is just incredible to be a part of, you know, walking out into an arena full of 90,000 or a hundred thousand people and they're all dead quiet and 
you know, you got the, the sumo <laughs> guy banging on the drum and stuff like that. I mean, the, mm. the production that they put on is, is really fun to be a part of. We gotta get that sumo guy to bang on the drum for submission radio. That would be something mm-hmm. special. <laughs> you know, spe- speaking speaking of speaking of pride, I'm glad that you mentioned pride because we always have a lot of guys on from pride. We had Bob Sab, Don Fry, just the who's who of pride, and they always have an interesting, crazy, or funny story from their tr- time with the company. Do you have anything that you remember from your time in Japan that you can talk to us about with pride? Any funny, crazy, or interesting stories from being with that company? Uh, you know, honestly, no, nothing. Uh... Nothing stands out. I mean, you know, obviously the, the production and stuff was, was something to behold and to be a part of. Um, you know, just th- there was one time I fought in a show. It wasn't really a pride show, but a lot of the Japanese shows are all kind of interrelated. Mm. Um, I was called by Coliseum 2000. It was, I think it was in early 2000, actually. Uh, and then we fought at the, uh, I believe it was the Saitama Super Arena. And they had the locker rooms on the far side of the venue from where the ring was. So, like, you couldn't walk. They actually came to get you when it was time to go to the cage. They would come and get you out of the locker room in a little golf cart and drive you around the outside of the building. It took, like, 30 minutes to get there. Whoa. Because they just they put everybody on the far side of the cage, so there was no way you could uh, you could walk through it and get there in time. That's crazy. So when when, yeah. they, when you did this 30-minute trip, was it literally time to enter, or was it like, all right, you go in, you have your five, ten minutes, or was it like, okay, they, they drive you half an hour later, you walk through the cage, and bam, you're in the ring? Uh, no, they drive you around to like a secondary staging area, so then you would have, you know, have five or ten minutes before your, before your fight to, to, to finish warming up or whatever, and then, and then go. Wow, that's crazy. I'd feel like you'd have to kiss all your relatives goodbye, like, all right, I'm off, I'll, I'll, I'll see you later, instead of just, like, them waiting in the back. What, yeah, kind of. What motivates Jeremy Horn to get out of bed and hit the gym every day 20 years later, in a simple sort of, you know, sentence? You know, well, I mean, it's just a love of the sport. You know, I still get up every day. I love I love teaching. I love watching guys learn. I love that spark you see in somebody's eye when, when a technique you're trying to teach them finally catches and they understand it. Uh you know, I, I still just love the sport. Robbie Law versus GSP. Who do you think wins and how? I don't know. That's a really, really tough fight. Uh, St. Pierre is very, very well-rounded. He's very, very solid, but he's also very conservative. Uh, whereas Robbie, you know, has has amazing skills um, at, at staying off his back and getting back up and uh, very, very dangerous on his feet. But, uh, you know, I don't know if his, uh, you know, a little bit more wide-open style – would be able to hold off St. Pierre for forever. Um, I don't know. I said that that's a tough fight. I mean, I would have to go with Robbie, but but not by a landslide. Sure. Uh, what's a tough fight? What's the best advice ever given to you by a coach? Oh wow! Uh, I don't know. That's a tough one. <laughs> and anything, anything growing up, anything ever, anyone ever said that sort of inspired you in any way? <laughs> well. Um, nothing that really inspired me, but, uh, one thing I have had a couple of coaches tell me, uh, you know, as, as growing up, uh, you know, as a, as a martial artist and a fighter is don't quit your day job. <laughs> you know, mar- and, and, you know, they, they say it as a joke and they say it as there's no money in the sport, but what it really boils down to is if you come into this sport because you're trying to make money, you're going to lose. You're in the wrong sport. You know, if you're coming into this sport because you're trying to get famous, you're in the wrong sport. You need to come into this sport because you love martial arts and you love training and you love being in the gym. If that's the case, you can work your day job and then come to the gym at night and still do what you love doing. But people, Jared, that, you know, they just decide out of the blue, well, I want to be a fighter now because it's my dream to, to fight in the UFC and, and uh, I want to quit my job. You're making a mistake because this is not an easy way to make money. Now, Jeremy, give us your thoughts. What What are your thoughts on women's MMA? You're a pioneer in MMA for men. What do you think about the how the sports come along for women? It has come a long way. There's a lot more technique in it than there used to be. Um, but as most women's sports go that that follow men's sports, um, there you know there are a few steps behind. Uh, you know, they've, they've got a little bit to go to catch up, but uh, but you know they're gaining uh, they're gaining ground quickly. Now, Jeremy, you feel like you're the perfect person to ask. What's the secret to longevity in MMA? Don't fight stupid. Don't don't fight for the entertainment of the crowd. Fight for a win. And that doesn't mean be boring, but fight intelligently. Don't brawl. Don't be stupid. 
fight with a smart game plan to get a finish as soon as you can. This this uh, tap out round question actually comes from a fan. His name's Tagam Tagamest Cast. Yeah, Tagamest. Tagamest. Okay. He he's asking. Describe the following fighters in one word. Nick Diaz. Awesome. Conor McGregor. Entertaining. John Jones. Arrogant. You know, it's funny when you said Conor McGregor, I actually had entertaining in my mind as well. Now. Uh... We've got a question also from Based. Uh, ask he wants to know if there's any guys out of your gym that we should be looking out for. Uh, yeah, we've got a few guys actually. Uh, one uh, that's going to be making a break at something real soon here's a guy named David Putson. He is 21 years old, or maybe 22 now. Uh, he's trained with me since he was about 12. He's got an 11 and one amateur record and now a seven and0 pro record. Wow. and uh, he's he's fought some tough guys, mostly uh, handful of local guys. A handful of regional guys, but uh, he's crushed everybody, and he's been doing it really as kind of a kid, training part time because he thinks it's fun. Um, he only recently mm -hmm. has started dedicating himself to really training um, and trying to make something of this. But he's a perfect example, you know. Started as a little kid and trained because it was fun, and now he loves training and fighting is just a pleasant bonus. Well, everybody's got to check him out after this interview. Make sure you look him up, guys. I just want to go back to um, the fan question before where you said the one word about every fighter. You mentioned arrogant for John Jones. I know he rubs a lot of guys the wrong way, and me and Cass actually have spoken about it on the show a few times. Can you just expand on that for us, Jeremy? You know, what what are your thoughts on Jones? Um, you know, I, I don't know. It's hard to say because I don't know him personally, so I, I can only gauge – by what I've seen of him in the media and in the, you know, in the, in the spotlight, but I, I don't know. He, he just seems very, very arrogant to me. Um, you know, he went through a long stint where he was, you know, claiming to be something that he wasn't, it seems, uh, claiming to be a lot more righteous and, and, uh, and holy, if you will. And then a lot of these negative things started coming up and popping up to, to reveal that, you know, what he did behind closed doors was nothing like what he, uh, professed to be, um, you know, uh, that's you know, uh, it's not a whole lot of thought put into it, but that's you know, that's kind of mostly where my opinion comes from. He's certainly a talented fighter, but I don't think he's anywhere near as good as he thinks he is. Sure. Now, finally, Jeremy, after all the amazing things you've done, give us your favorite moment of your fighting career thus far. You know, I've had I've had such a good run. I've had so many good times. I I don't think I could pick just one. You know, I've loved a lot of moments in the fight. I mean, really, from the time I was, you know. 15, uh, you know, I've, I've been living the life of my dreams. I've been done, done exactly what I wanted to do every day of my life. Um, so, you know, it's hard to pick just one moment. Well, guys, don't forget, Jeremy, we're having another moment. He'll be taking on Tony Lopez March 28th at the Sugar Hill Showdown at Sugar Creek Casino in Hinton, Oklahoma, United States. We wish we were closer so that we could go. Make sure to check out also Jeremy's gym. It is 7932 South, 1530 West, uh, Jordan, Utah. And uh, for all the more details, you can go to ElitePerformanceGym.com. Jeremy, it's been an absolute pleasure and honor to chat to you today. Awesome. Thanks for having me on, guys. Hey guys, this is Frank Yeager and you're listening to Submission Radio. Our next guest will take on Chad Mendes on April 4th at UFC in the headlining fight. He's coming off a very slick finish over Dennis Bermudez at UFC Mexico. Ricardo Lamas, welcome back to Submission Radio. Thanks a lot, man. Thanks for having me. Hey, it's always good to chat to you, Ricardo. You know, while it seems like a blur, you were last in the octagon at UFC Mexico in November. You know, you've managed to have a bit of a break in between fights. Tell us, what have you been up to during your break? Um, a lot of stuff going on in my personal life. You know, I got married, I have a baby on the way and, uh, just kind of dealing with all that as it comes and, and training on the side. Whoa, married and a baby. That's crazy. <laughs> Congratulations, Ricardo. Hey, just wondering, uh, before we continue on the, with the normal questions, has that changed you at all? Like uh, your perspective at MMA and the sport at all now that you're a married man and a father? Um, you know, it's definitely given me kind of a, a newfound motivation. And, you know, I always use the, you know, providing for, for a future family as part of my motivation for training and fighting and all that. But now it's just, you know, it's real. It's something that I have to do. So uh, it definitely pushes me to, to work harder in the gym. 
Yeah, absolutely. We bet. You know, uh, Ricardo, we want to look at one of your tweets. On February 27th, you tweeted that if Sun City, Arizona was smart, they'd have me on a plane right now to come handle this llama problem. Hashtag llama wrangler. <laughs> did they end up calling the problem solver in to handle the situation, Ricardo? <laughs> no, they did not. They, they just let those llamas run loose, loose forever. And I think no, uh, a couple of people finally last out them. But, uh, you know, <laughs> if they wanted to get the job done the right way, they should have given me a call. Unbelievable. City, Sun City, Arizona, what are you thinking? Now, unlike the llama wrangling, your opponent, Chad Mendes, he's a tough challenge. Um, out of everyone that you fought thus far, do you see him as one of your toughest opponents, Ricardo? I see every opponent that I have as my toughest one to date. Um, you know, every fight that I have, I, I take as the most important fight of my career. So this one is no different. And I would say that, yes, he's definitely one of the toughest opponents I've ever had. You know, a while back, after you went over Bermudez, you mentioned, I believe it was to MMA Junkie, that Conor McGregor was the next fight that you were interested in. You know, what were your initial thoughts when you found out you'd be fighting Chad Mendes? You know, were you happy that you'd be fighting Chad, or were you disappointed that you wouldn't be able to, you know, fight Conor at the time that you wanted to? I knew I knew that fighting Conor was going to be a long shot. Uh, I knew they were kind of grooming him for a title shot, uh, especially if he would have won over Dennis Sieber. Um So... With that being said, I, I knew that it was either going to be Chad Mendes or Frankie Edgar that they'd match me up with, and it came, you know, it was no surprise to me when they gave when they uh, called us up with the opportunity to fight Chad. So I was already prepared for it and, and said, yeah, let's do it. I think I'm going to know the an your answer to the next question, but obviously a lot of people know that the winner of this fight will probably – get a title shot at whoever wins between McGregor and Aldo. In this in this case, will you be trying to make a big statement against Chad in this fight to really guarantee that next title shot? I really try. I try to make a statement in every fight. You know, you, you have to go in there and you have to perform and you have to finish fights. That's what the people want to see and that's what moves you ahead in line. So uh, I'll definitely be looking to do that. Well, you definitely made a great statement against Dennis Bermudez. You know, talk to us about the matchup ahead. How do you stack up against Chad Mendes, and what do you think his strengths are against him? Um, I think I stack up well against anyone, you know. Uh, I'm, I'm a very tenacious fighter, and, and I keep moving forward, and the more damage you do to me, it, it kind of fuels me to, to keep going. You know, I, I push past pain. I push past fatigue, and uh, that's going to be one of my biggest strengths going into this fight. And, uh, you know, I just think it's going to be a great fight for all the fans to see. Well, Chad said that he'll be looking for a KO of the night in your fight. Um, against a guy like Chad, where do you see most of the fight taking place? Obviously, you'll just sort of play it by ear and let it come. But what do you think? More on the feet or on the ground in this one? I can honestly see it going anywhere. Um, we're both great wrestlers. We're, we both have great stand-up. We're both comfortable on our feet. So this fight has the ability to, to, to really go anywhere. Now, Chad mentioned when he was on the show that your striking is decent, however, that some of his advantages are speed and power. Also, he mentioned that he thought you were most dominant when you're on top, and that's basically one of his strongest defenses. You know, what do you think of Chad's analysis of the fight? Um, you know, everybody, you know, no matter who you're asking, everybody's going to think they're better at this and that, but the the real answers will, will come on April, April 4th. So, uh, you know, I think that I I stand well against him against any in in any uh, division of the sport. You know what I mean? This whether we're standing up, whether we're on the ground, whatever. I think I could uh, I can uh, hang in there with him no matter what we're doing. It's going to be an exciting matchup. Now I don't know if you know this, Ricardo, but here in Melbourne, Australia, there's the Comedy Festival that's coming up, and I almost feel like they need to allocate a spot to yourself because you've done some very very good work my friend in the field of comedy some of your videos about conor mcgregor have been hilarious all fans around the world have been enjoying them it's a different side of ricardo lamas as well that everybody loves seeing you know it seemed like it's something that you really enjoyed doing as well tell us for the fans that don't know how did you get into doing these videos and is it something that you just enjoy doing uh it was the the mcgregor video was kind of an idea that i had for a while and uh, it kind of got put on the back burner for a while there. And and after my Mexico fight, I kind of had some time off. So I thought it'd be, you know, a good time to just put a funny video together and release it. And, you know, I'm just trying to have fun with my job now. You know, the 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 previous year I was really stressed out with trying to fight for the title shot and all that. And, and now I just want to have fun with what I'm doing. Yeah, absolutely. It seems like the video has actually sort of bothered Connor a little bit. Do you think that these kinds of uh, techniques are slowly sort of getting into Connor's head a little bit? 
uh, I think it definitely bothered him, and that was that was kind of the point. You know, he's always one that that talks trash about other people, and uh, he doesn't like it too much when when the tables are turned. So it was good to give him a dose of his own medicine. Well, Ricardo, you said in an interesting comment during your interview as well, the Steven McGregor fight, you know, you said that it's a bit of fun and then if Conor wants to dish it out, he can take it too. Does it seem that although McGregor, you know, he's an expert trash talker, he takes a lot of comments directed at him to heart? Uh, I don't know. You know, he, he claims that, that nothing phases him, but uh, I think that the video that I made definitely got under his skin and, and uh, I think if anything, it, it'll make him want to fight me and... and you know, help me towards that goal of mine. You were in a bit of an awkward situation where Paddy O'Houlihan tried to confront you backstage. He looked really up, genuinely upset about the clips. That must have been a pretty awkward situation for you. What did you make of that whole thing? Uh, I didn't really know what he was saying. <laughs> <laughs> you know, his, uh, he has quite a thick Irish accent. So, I mean, the only thing I got in the beginning, he said that video was shite. So I, I knew he, he didn't like the video too much, but... After that was just a uh, a blur of question marks in my head. I, I didn't know what he was saying. So uh, it, it wasn't really awkward for me. It was, you know, he might as well have been speaking French or something because I had no idea what he was complaining about. <laughs> That's hilarious. You know, you've been in the octagon with Jose Aldo recently, and we had TJ Dillashaw on the show who said he thought McGregor stood a chance as the fight won't go to the ground. Do you envision Connor having a chance when he fights Aldo? I think anybody has a chance against anyone in this sport. That's what makes this sport so great, you know, and, and TJ Dillashaw was a prime example of that. You know, I think everybody counted him out against, uh, Burrell and he went in there and, and he put on a clinic and, uh, I would never count anybody out of a fight. Now, this is a bit of a different, uh, question here, Ricardo, but what, everybody's wondering this and we, we have to ask it, you know, with the big Reebok deal approaching, have you heard any more details on how the deal will affect you? And are you looking forward to the ch changes come July? Because it is pretty soon. Uh, I have not heard any specifics yet as far as numbers um, of what we're going to be paid. Uh, so we're just kind of waiting on that. And I hope it works out to, to where I'm at least making the same as I'm making now for my sponsors because I, I have a lot of great sponsors that take care of me right now. You know, a lot of fighters have come out and sort of said like, oh, you know, we may be losing money and this and that. But I guess you sort of hit the nail on the head. A lot of people don't actually know what you'll be getting. Assuming that you get what you get with your current sponsors, would you see it as a good thing, the Reebok deal? Would you be happy with the deal if that was the case? If I was getting the, the same amount of money that I'm getting right now, yeah, I think it's a good deal. Yeah, it's it's definitely a, a good move for the sport in, in a lot of directions. Now, Ricardo, obviously, you know, you've got thousands and thousands of fans here in Australia, across America, and in Asia as well, New Zealand. We haven't forgotten about you. We've got a couple of fan questions here for you. The first one is from Knight Rider 89 He goes, Ricardo, you recently tweeted, man, dot, 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 when is everyone going to learn, question mark, hashtag, your piss won't lie for you. What was your reaction when you found <laughs> out Anderson Silva tested positive for steroids, and what are your thoughts on the rampant PEDs in MMA? Uh, I was just disappointed. You know, he, he was such a a great ambassador for the sport and it kind of taints his image a little bit. And, you know, I, if I was in charge of everything, I would say it's, you know, zero tolerance, you know, you get caught once using steroids and you're out of the sport. Uh, we, we, we need to legitimize the sport and we don't have any room for, for cheaters to be in here, you know, using PEDs and steroids. This is just a side question, Ricardo, but obviously the UFC had that press conference and they addressed the PEDs and they said that first offenders as of July, you know, they could be catching two years, four years. You know, Matt Brown was saying he wants five years. I, would, I take it you were happy with those kind of changes. Uh, yeah, I think the harsher the penalty, the better. Um, you know, like I said, we, we need to get rid of all this stuff. This is, uh, it's been too many people that, that have been getting caught with all this and it, it's just becoming ridiculous. Ricardo, I'll go to the next uh, fan question. The Regal King, Ricardo, uh, his question is, Ricardo, out of all the awesome fights you've had, what would you say is your favorite? Out of the, out of the, the Australian fights? No, no, just say any, you know, he said out of the awesome fights. So any, any fights, what was your favorite? Oh, okay. Um, uh, I'd say Shogun versus uh, Henderson was one of my favorites. I remember I was just on the edge of my chair the whole time, like jumping all around. So that was one that, that really sticks out in my head. What about one of your fights? Like out of your fights that you fought, any? What? Which one did you say is your favorite thus far? 
Um, I think the last one is probably my favorite thus far. You know, it was it just meant a lot to me to be on the first card in Mexico, being half Mexican, and uh, the crowd was was behind me 100, percent and it was just a, an awesome feeling. And now we've got the last fan question here, Ricardo, from Goodnight Charlie. Goodnight Charlie is going, if everything goes to plan and it looks like uh, you versus Conor McGregor for the title later on this year, what's your prediction? How, how would you be beating Conor McGregor? Uh, my prediction would be the same as any other. You know, I'm going to go in there and, and finish the fight. Uh, I think that he's lacking in the, in the wrestling uh, part of, of mixed martial arts, and I'd expose his weakness. Now, Ricardo, before we finish the interview, of course, we have to do the submission radio tap out round with you. You're no stranger to this whole bunch of fun questions, and you answer with the first thing that comes to mind. So I'll kick it off. Ricardo, you enjoy going to dog shows, and you have an obsession with the Napoleon Mastiff. Is this true? <laughs> yeah, I I, uh, I was watching the dog show on TV, and, and the Napoleon Mastiff came on, and it just looked like a real cool dog, uh, dog to me. So those in English Bull Terriers, I'm, I'm pretty obsessed. I, I sorry. I, I feel. I feel like this is so unexpected coming from you. I don't know if you're familiar with the Seinfeld episode where Desperado comes on and and those people just go into their own zone. Is it like that for you as well, Ricardo? When the Napoleon Mastiff comes on, <laughs> it's uh, it, the obsession isn't that uh, bad. Actually, my obsession with English bull terriers is a lot worse. My uh, I have a bar in the basement of my house that's completely decorated with like Spud McKenzie and English bull terrier memorabilia, and wow. I own two of them. So. I'd say that that's the bigger obsession. Wow, they have memorabilia? That's crazy. It must be like a signed trading card or something. Now, speaking of Seinfeld, Ricardo, we saw you celebrated Festivus over the Christmas period. <laughs> Happy delayed Festivus to yourself. Sorry we weren't there. We couldn't make it this year. <laughs> Tell us, how did the airing of the grievances go? The airing of grievances went well, and so did the feats of strength. People, uh, <laughs> I had a lot of bones to pick with people, and they heard about it. <laughs> but what about, what about yourself? What, what Did they bring anything up about Ricardo Lamas that sort of was a bit sour? Of course not, man. I'm perfect. <laughs> <laughs> they would have lost their train of thought anyway. Now, you mentioned on Twitter, UFC put us up in an old creepy hotel. These long hallways remind me of the hotel from The Shining. If I see a pair of bloodied up twin girls, I'm drop kicking their asses. <laughs> <laughs> Any close experiences with ghosts that you can share with us, Ricardo? Uh, no, actually, one of the PR people ha had some weird experiences in that hotel. Um, her closet door seemed to have opened by itself, I guess she said. It was it was closed, and then she went to the washroom. When she came out, the door was wide open, so that would have kind of freaked me out. But uh, luckily, I didn't have any uh, experiences uh, at that hotel, so well, uh, I was good. Well, Ricardo, you also tweeted out a while back during a flight a picture of a couple saying, I think the couple next to me on the plane are trying for the Mile High, my high Club. <laughs> Hashtag I'm watching you. Hashtag no funny business. So my question to you is, what is it about sitting next to Ricardo Lamas that ignites passion between couples on planes? I don't know. It's just my, my Latin fiery blood, I guess. You know, we're very passionate people, so it just kind of rubs off. Jesus, I hope Dennis and I never sit next to you on uh, on a plane, Ricardo. Just being honest, <laughs> I, I hope so too. <laughs> <laughs> Ricardo, uh, we've got a couple of questions now. This is going to be an interesting one. Uh, some of these are fan requests, and uh, they actually wanted to ask a few questions of Conrad McGillicuddy. I don't know how available he is at the time, uh, but we're just wondering if it's possible to ask Conrad a couple of questions. Sure, go ahead. All right, Conrad, uh, how do you see the fight going with Jose Aldo? I see myself getting punched in the face a lot. That's about it. <laughs> now, 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 Conrad, why do you have a tattoo of a giraffe on your chest? Because it's really intimidating. You know, it's a, it's a giraffe eating a person's arm off. And that's what I do. I go on the fight and I chew people's arms off. <laughs> I kick their arms clean off. <laughs> Conrad, do you have a message for the fans listening today? No, I just want to say thanks for all the support. And, you know, I, I love being here. Final question from the fans, Conrad. What's something that fans don't know about you, a secret that you still haven't told anybody? One time I made out with a transvestite in a bar. But don't <laughs> tell anyone that. <laughs> That's awesome, Ricardo. And uh, back to you, Ricardo. You know, if, if you could come back for the last tap out round question, give us your predictions. What's the official prediction? How do you see yourself beating Chad Mendes? Uh, I'm going for a KO, man. You know, I want to give the people what they, what they want to see and everybody wants to see a knockout. 
Absolutely right. Well, guys, you can watch Ricardo take on Chad Mendes on April 4th at UFC Fight Night 63. And make sure to follow him on Twitter. Clearly, you can see he's got some hilarious tweets at Ricardo Lams MMA. Ricardo, it's always a pleasure. Thanks a lot, guys. This is Tito Ortiz, the People's Champ, and you're listening to Submission Radio. All right, guys, our next guest has trained and competed in martial arts such as karate, taekwondo, wushu, kung fu, sanshao, draka, shoot boxing, muay thai, and boxing. He is the trainer at Glendale Fight Club and coaches UFC fighters Jake Ellenberger, Travis Brown, Manny Gamburian, and bantamweight champion Ronda Rousey, to mention a few. He is none other than Edmund Traverdian. Edmund, welcome to Submission Radio. How are you? Good, good. How are you guys? Thanks for having me on. Oh, the pleasure is all ours. Now, Edmund, before we talk about some of your amazing fighters you train, let's talk about you. You know, how did you first get into uh, martial arts? Ah, uh, you know, back home in Armenia, everybody either fought, you know, did some type of martial arts, boxing, or played soccer. So, um, just fell with it from there and moved to the states in '89. Um, started training in the United States since I was seven. So then competing in different styles of martial arts and just up and at my own gym when I was 16 years old. So, Yeah, well, we were, we were going to mention that. You began teaching at, you know, the ripe age of 16, which is crazy for a lot of people. Um, what was it like for you to start your teaching career at such a young age? Is it just something that came naturally to you? Uh, it was, yeah, it was natural, um, but of course it was tough, you know, to earn all the respect from all the parents I had in the gym that brought their kids to me. <laughs> mm. Some of the kids would have been older than you. Some of the kids would have been older than you. I had been... a lot of students older than me, you know, I yeah. started off with only like 12, with only 12 kids and slowly, you know, I picked up many, many more came and it's all about, it's how you carry yourself, you know, went through a lot of, a lot of hard days, but stayed in there, stayed focused, and just, you know, did it because I love to do it, and never thought about just making money, this and that, I mean, it was more about to teaching, teaching, you know, sharing my knowledge, and just, it worked out. Well, it definitely worked out, because now you train some of the best fighters in the world. You know, we mentioned some of the different styles that you trained in and competed in. You also had a couple of MMA fights in 2012, both of which you won. You know, what made you want to do MMA, and also why did you choose to not have any more MMA fights afterwards? It's funny. Uh, I, I, I retired fighting my, my Muay Thai fights, you know. I, I had my Muay Thai fights competitions, and I retired and focused more on training, you know, a lot, and... Uh, Ronda called me one day, said that, hey, I think you should, you, you know, you're still fit and you could fight and I think you should fight because uh, you, you'll do very well and you could fight like Anderson, you know, you got the movement, you're fluid, your ground game's good, your takedown defense awesome. And she encouraged me, I said, all right, I'll do it. I just, <laughs> you know, jumped in there and did two fights and that was it, you know, just too busy with the fighters, I guess. It's difficult for me because my second fight I was traveling and I had a fighter up in Vegas and then I had to come down prepare myself, you know, for the last week, uh, which is very important and it's difficult. And so that's why I thought that the best thing for me is to be a trainer. I'm curious, Edmund, do you think that if MMA was as big as it is now back in the day when you, you know, migrated to the U.S., you would have sort of dedicated more time to it and possibly had a longer career as a fighter in MMA? Absolutely. I love to fight, and it's in me, you know, until now, I think it's like to fight, but if MMA was, you know, I was just more of a stand-up fighter, and when I boxed in the boxing gyms, you know, the best boxing gyms in the world in the United States, and everybody would tell me, why the hell are you kickboxing, you know? There's so much money to be made in boxing, and I had a martial arts gym, and I was like, man, if I box, I have to do it full-time, you know, I, I can't coach, and it's a serious sport, you know? Deep competition, and I sparred with the best, and, you know, I, I knew I could do it. So it was, if I think MMA would would be the right thing for me to do if I thought it's going to be as big as it is now. But I'm blessed, and I'm happy where where, where I'm at right now. I, you know, I have the best female fighter in the world, and I'm happy. I'm happy with all their success. I feel like I fight, you know, myself. Sure. Let's talk about some of your fighters. You know, one of your star pupils is obviously Jake Allenberger. He really seems to have turned a corner in his last fight against Josh Koscheck. You know, what do you think of Jake's performance, and did he execute his game plan perfectly? Uh, yeah, Jake did well. You know, I had Ronda on the card, so I had one of my assistant trainers um, walk out with him, but he did training camp in my gym. And, uh, Jake, Jake's a strong fighter, very explosive fighter. He 
you know, he had two two losses, two, three losses back to back. And, you know, it's a bit of a confidence thing for him. And now he's picking it up. He was looking better in the gym and, you know, tough less losses and it's difficult to bounce back sometimes. But all he has to do is believe in himself because he can do it. And he performed better with Koscheck. And I want to see him keep on doing the same thing. It's interesting that you mentioned a lot of the mental issues that Jake might have had after having some a string of tough losses. Just curious, obviously, as one of the best coaches in the world, you know, what do you attribute to his decline before he came to the gym? And how do you, how do you work with a guy like Jake, you know, who has a string of losses and mentally maybe, you know, some of those mental things are affecting him. He's got some mental issues going into the next fight. How do you work with a guy like that and get him back to looking the way that he looked against Josh Koscheck? You just test him in the gym, you know, test him in the gym, and he had tactical mistakes that he lost, but it's not only that. I think that there is more to just being making tactical mistakes, you know. He's, he he goes out there and does what he's supposed to. He, he'll get the victory. He's very strong and explosive, and, you know, I told him that I want the old Jake back, you know, that always went for the finish and was aggressive, and I want to see that, and I, I could always add techniques i didn't want to change the style of fighting i love aggressive fighters and that go for the finish and jake was uh, a rated fighter when he came into the gym he was a top 10 fighter in the ufc and you know there's something there that brought him to that level it wasn't only the technique it was his aggressiveness and his punching power and, and he, he was committed to everything he does he trains hard and i told him that i want to i want to see that i could i could show you so much that you could you could do but it's all the you know the key is in your hand for you to open it up and really use it and you know it's uh, I challenging him with a lot of good sparring in the gym and i always speak to him hey you know i it's a strategy for a trainer to watch an athlete that is capable of doing it and does not perform and uh, he, i keep on telling him that that he can you know it's in his hand and he's supposed to go out there and just go for it all the way you know be committed, be focused, and show your heart. And once he does that, I think I think he'll he'll be good. So it's all about just preparing him mentally a little bit, giving him the challenges in the gym proper way. You know, some days and him having an advantage and an edge on some of the sparring partners, and sometimes being tested. You know, with the tough ones and being able to just overcome all those uh, tough days in the gym and being prepared uh, for, for combat. Yeah, sure. And, uh, you know, it's going to be very exciting because a few years ago, you know, like you said, the old Jake, he was the guy who people were saying could possibly beat GSP and be part of that new breed of welterweights. You know, do you think that 215 could really be Jake's year and Jake could possibly become a contender again? He could. He can, for sure. You know, Jake, one thing I tell him that is the number one, he's got a chin, you know. Jake has a chin. Mm. Those guys in that division hit pretty hard. Robbie Lawler is a big puncher, and was catching him on shots. He was saying it pretty well. I remember there was a round. I said, you got to just plant your feet and just go for the finish with Robbie. And, you know, he caught Robbie Lawler and Robbie, Robbie felt those shots. Robbie's a tough, very tough, and he's a champion now. And, you know, Jake, Jake has a jaw. He got his, you know, orbital bone um, cracked and broken, you know, in that fight. And he is, I, I was hurt, so it had to end. But if you see the shots he took on his jaw, he was saying it pretty well. You know, all he has to do is just believe in himself a little bit more and know that he, he could take shots and, you know, take those little bit risks that he's always been taking. And now even if he takes it, he's more polished, I think, and understands how to box much better and just be the old Jake with the combined new, um, you know, combinations and all the skills that he's learned. He's settling down on his legs better and he's looking better. Uh, definitely he could he could still bounce back and be a champion. It's all about if he, you know, he finds that belief in himself and knows that, you know, he 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 can do it, and it, it could be tomorrow. He could wake up and start demolishing people again in that octagon, you know, that he's done before. Yeah, it's all very exciting. And Jake's a great guy, always on our show every every few months. All the best to him. Let's talk about Travis Brown. He was a guy that we were hanging out, believe it or not, in Melbourne over the weekend. He was all the way down here. They were actually auctioning off a a racing helmet, Edmund, and I was trying to get Travis Brown to buy it for you as a present, but it got up to $2,000 and he declined. Um, he was a guy that was training for a long time at Greg Jackson's and, and Coach Winks. He's been training with you at Glendale Fight Club for a while now and also happened, you know, happens to you know, be one of the biggest guys in the division. When Travis first came to you, what was the first thing that you decided to work on him with? Ah. Uh... Travis Brown, discipline, you know, he, is, he was a bit all over the place when he fights. 
you know, he would, um, yes, go for the finish. He's tough. He's, you know, he's that hard for days, and he's shown that. And he fought the fight with Verdun for, um, you know, five, five rounds with a broken hand from the first round. It shows a lot of heart and courage, but doesn't mean he should lose himself, you know, mentally and not not still get the W. I believe today uh, Travis Brown could, you know, win a fight with somebody like we're doing with just his lead hand. If his right hand is broken, he could use his jab. He's got that athleticism, the speed, the power, and the, the knowledge. So when he came to me, I said, I don't care if your hand's broken. You know, he showed a heart, but you didn't get the win. You know, you got two legs and you got a left hand. And he never watched this fight with Verdum until he came to the gym. He said, Coach, I want to watch it with you. I want to see, you know, what you think. And when I was watching it, because I haven't even seen it, uh, I watched it with him. I, I noticed that Travis Brown just stood up and started uh, walking in the gym really, really upset and angry. And he, he, he was, I could see how upset he was. And I like fighters like that because, you know, he he knows he could have done better and, you know, he was coming off the loss, but I saw a lot of pride and heart in him when he was upset and pacing himself in the gym and walking around, you know, very angry and very upset. So I knew that he's a fighter. And when he came into the gym, there was a lot of things, of course, I could teach him. Now he's looking great. He's sparring with boxing, uh, Olympians, great fighters, undefeated prospects in my gym, and he's looking very, very good. He's learning every day. He loves to learn. He's a very, very unique individual. He takes things a lot to his heart. He's very emotional about most of the things that if, you know, he doesn't get the best of anybody in the gym, he takes it to the heart. And I love fighters like that because it means a lot to them if they're getting their ass whipped in a sparring session, you know. They want to perform better and they don't want that to happen to them ever, especially in the, in the octagon. So, um, he, he's a great athlete. I would say, you know, the uh, heavyweight runs great. You know, he goes out on the track, runs as uh, quick, as fast as my lightweight boxing kids that they run every day, you know, wow. boxing boys. Mm. So he's, a, he's an amazing athlete. He's looking better every day. You know, it was the first camp we did together on that shop site, and he did get the knockout. I, it's a bit difficult, like I said, to fight fighters like that are afraid and just run and then right away because of their fear explode with some type of a combination. That's what kind of a uh, fighter shop was. And it's not easy to deal with fighters like that at the beginning. But, you know, next fight we have Orlovsky and he's more, you know, he's not afraid to exchange and, you know, he'll try to fight wood and he's got more skills, better boxing skills. And I, I promise everybody to do it. Travis Brown will show his skills much better than he did with the Brendan fight because that guy can't fight. He just run away, runs away and rushes you and it's not easy to deal with people like that with all the experience I have with all my fighters so um but he still performed he got the knockout and you know he's had he has good things he's learned from Jackson's I can't talk anything uh, negative they have a great team they have uh, champion John Jones in their gym and They've uh, done things to bring up great fighters, and they know what they're doing, and their fighters are always fit and ready to fight. And he has had good guidance, but I, uh, he feels comfortable with me. I could take him to the next level. Awesome. Travis Brown 2.0 coming. Now, uh, just also, you know, with this Andre Olovsky fight, obviously it's happening at the very, very stacked UFC 187. Uh, are you working on anything specific or new for this fight, or is it just more of, you know, continuation of what you guys have been working on thus far? Mm, yeah, yeah, well, definitely. You know, every every fight we have, uh, we have we're ready for every type of exchange, wherever the fight goes. So, you know, um, I'm not going to talk about that too much, but right now my focus is on getting um, Travis better every day in the gym and, you know, grow, grow as a fighter, for him to grow as a fighter. And he's putting a lot of new skills in his combinations and, you know, his footwork, his distance, understanding when to get the best of the exchanges because that's very important when you fight and how to get the best of the exchanges. And he's been great and he's been learning. Yeah, absolutely. And just quickly, you mentioned Vadum before. Travis Brown 2.0 versus Vadum again down the line. Different outcome in your in your opinion, isn't that right, Edmund? Uh, absolutely. I I would love that fight. Absolutely. 
I know how emotional he took that fight, you know, to his heart, that how what that lost it to him. And I believe in my fighter. I believe in my fighter within um, the skills and the approach in training camps. And, uh, you know, I wouldn't say this about every fighter, but definitely Travis Brown will, will be a different story when he fights Verdum second mm -hmm. time. Sure. Now, we want to jump over to Ronda Rousey. You know, it seems like she'll be facing Bech Gaia at UFC 190 in Brazil. Is this the fight that you expected for Ronda, or were you surprised at all that that was the matchup she got? Yeah, no, not surprised. You know, she 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 wants to fight, and, you know, Dana always makes the, um, their contenders out there. You know, they're in the top ten, these girls. Anybody deserves to fight Ronda, and if she's online, you know we'll fight her, and there's more girls, of course, that do deserve to fight Ronda also, like Jessica I, and, you know, their time will come too. I mean, she's fighting Misha and even a rematch with Misha. You know, definitely it's, she deserves to be fighting Ronda and I'm okay with it. And it, it's fun. Ronda's going to demolish her, you know, in front of her hometown so she could, you know, keep her mouth a bit cold. You know, I re usually don't get into female business, you know and they're fighters, but definitely this chick talks a little bit too much, and Ronda's real excited to fight her, real focused, and is going to uh, uh, eat her alive. That's what she's going to do, <laughs> you know? Yeah, it must have been annoying hearing Abetch uh, always sort of talking stuff about your team and uh, some of the fighters in the, in the team. What would you say would be some of her biggest strengths against Ronda, and what do you think are her biggest weaknesses as well? Who, Betch? What, is, what does she have? Yeah. yeah, what does she have? Do you think she has anything for Ronda? Nothing. Nothing. Nobody. Nobody. There, there could be three Betches together. Or how mm -hmm. many? How many Betch word is five, five letters, yeah, right, to spell that out? There could be five or her. Five. <laughs> Chicks like that, they can't do shit to Ronda. <laughs> so, in terms of, let, I mean, let's let's break it down. Obviously, Ronda's got fantastic judo. You know, her striking is coming up. How do you see the fight? I guess playing out. And what what when you say she's got nothing for her, why is that? What do you think are Betch's weaknesses that will you know lead her to lose against Ronda? Betch doesn't. Ronda is a different level fighter. I'm not going to talk about Betch. You know, it, it, it's not fun for me to talk about a chick like that. Um, Ronda is the best in the world. That's about it. Ronda is in every area that you're asking me a question that Ronda is just too dominant. Uh, there's no problem. Yeah, all, all across the board. I mean, last time when she fought uh, Kadzangana, you gave a prediction. I believe it was a, a KO in, in a certain amount of time. What would your prediction be for this one, Edmund? What what do you think? How do you think this one plays out? <laughs> All the predictions I gave, I I usually talk to you know, the boys that commentate yeah. and Mark World, um, and so uh, if I could either or finish with a submission or a knockout, I think Ronda wants to beat her up though, a little bit because of you know the way she's been talking so. You know, that was the plan with Misha Tate because she speaks to these artists too that like to talk a little bit, you know, and around the beat up Misha Tate pretty bad before she submitted her, you know, rocked her into the third round. She didn't know where she was. It was good that she admitted at least she got hit so hard in the third round, you know, mm. with that right hand. So, Betch talks a little bit too much, so I'm thinking Ronda would want to punish her face a little bit and, you know, the way she punches now. Either or hand, either punch, whether it's a jab, right cross, left hook, right hook, left uppercut, left liver shot, right kidney shot, elbow. Everybody knows it's going to land and she'll kill her when it lands. She punches too big right now. You know, she drops a lot of people in the gym with 14 ounce gloves. These chicks can't take her shots. Wow. You know, obviously you've got a lot of confidence in Ronda striking. And uh, when she came into the sport, obviously her judo was her dominant I guess, skill, and now we're seeing her really mixing up, and her striking is now becoming another big thing for opponents to fear. You know, tell us a little bit about that journey with Ronda, you know, from first starting to train with you to, you know, to having a very, I guess, I don't want to say amateur striking, but not to where it is now, compared to now, where it's a really dominant force. Yeah. She started off, you know, with me from zero, so mm. putting a good foundation. I was really thinking about all the time her footwork. You know, taking shots away and using your judo. 
to get um, the the wins most effective and what she's best at. And the time has come right now that you know we after the two year process with her, I've only showed her how to you know keep a distance well, use her footwork and use her jab to set up. You know the way she gets in is she gets in with a great jab. Everybody's seen that, and that's the best the best weapon in the world to get inside if you want to get inside an opponent. And Ron has been doing that, and now time has come. You know, the first time I started working some good right hooks, you know, overhand punches and left hooks. She went in there and got a 16 second knockout against Alexis Davis. You know, she nailed it with her right hook, and that girl is tough. But the way Ronda punches it doesn't matter how tough you are. You're going to not be able to take it. I see that every day in the gym. She's, you know, spars with boxing world champions. Ronda Rousey, you know, spars eight rounds, ten rounds with boxing world champions. No, nobody's ever even beaten her around. Wow. So these, these girls, you know, they don't see that. We don't release that. We have a lot of footage, but that's for us. It's not important right now she's she's just you know great uh, she's learning every day and she loves it she spends three to four hours a day with me you know just working on her boxing skills until now you know she just flew out to brazil she was flying early in the morning the car had to pick her up at 11 a.m she was at my gym she drove from venice you know an hour to get here at nine to do a two-hour session with me before she flew out. Wow. So these girls, you know, none, none of them work the way Ronda works. They might think they do, but Ronda, it's a, it's a complete package of not only hard work, it's hard work, a lot of hard work, but a lot of intelligence. And this girl is too smart. She's too smart at what she does, and it's not only about the hard work, it's not only about the heart, it's about being intelligent too. She's an intelligent fighter in the ring. In the octagon, she's very smart, and people don't realize that. You know, these girls are good in front of her. I just believe in my fighter a lot. That's why I talk so highly about her. These girls are good. You could have Olympic gold medal uh, girls. You know, they have the 115 pound division right now. You could have great wrestlers, bronze medalists, silver medalists, whatever. Nobody's going to be able to do it the way Ronda does it. Why? Because Ronda is a smarter fighter. That's it. Ronda's yeah. too smart, and Ronda does it. Perfectly. She showed it every time she fights, she looks better. And that's what's going to happen to, you know, with Betch, and she's going to look way better and she's going to demolish her. Yeah, absolutely. And you mentioned Ronda going to Brazil. I mean, we speak to a lot of fighters on the show every week. A lot of the fighters that we speak to, they're not too happy about fighting in Brazil. Obviously, there's certain regulations and rules that don't always go down the way they want them to. Do you have any concerns about Ronda fighting in Brazil um, against Betch? <laughs> no, no way, no, no way. You know, Ronda, we don't, we never care. Ronda never cares about where she fights. She loves to, of course, she loves to fight in Brazil. She wants to fight for all the fans. She loves that. It's not like she doesn't care, but she's not caring. Meaning she, she doesn't care. Like you know, it could be anywhere. She's been in big arenas. You know, in the um, Olympic Games and the World Championships of Judo. She's perform you know in a lot of countries like she said they booed her this that she's so prepared mentally rule regulation it doesn't matter what nothing is gonna be different for Ronda Ronda is gonna take that as a motivation to her to beat her ass more that's it that's how she looks at it I just want to talk about another girl in the division you know Holly Holm she's someone who the UFC brought in and I think with the idea that her she will be a contender for Ronda soon you know she was obviously a world champion in boxing and of course she had her debut against Raquel Pennington on the same card at UFC 184 I'm just wondering I'm I imagine you were helping Ronda prepare but did you get a chance to watch that fight you know what did you think and do you think that Holly Holm could potentially be uh, a threat to Ronda at any point Holly Holmes is good. You know, she, she, she boxes. She has experience. She has um, experience in boxing, you know, more than most of these girls, you know, don't have so much experience in professional fighting. She has a lot of experience in boxing. And, you know, it was the first fight. I mean, she had a long layoff, she says, and, you know, came back all those nerves, this and that. But, you know, Raquel just was more subtle on her feet, pressing forward a little bit. She can't be a little pressured that well. 
you know, and uh, even though she's a boxer, it doesn't matter. You, you watch her boxing fight, she doesn't deal with pressure very, very well. And I've always said it, Ronda will beat Holly Holmes in a boxing match. Stops her in within three rounds. You know, so, we spoke... I, I wouldn't worry. Yeah, and it would, it, would, it would be an amazing matchup if it ever did happen. We spoke about how Bet, you know, had a bit of trash talk for, for Rousey and your camp and yourself. Just wondering what your thoughts are on Chris Cyborg. She's someone that's been wanting a fight with Ronda Rousey for a while. Just this week, um, she put out some pretty insulting comments about Ronda, uh, calling her scared and, 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 and other things as well. What do you guys think about Chris Cyborg and, you know, sort of these comments that she keeps throwing at Ronda? It, uh, it doesn't matter what she says. I'm sick and tired of hearing that girl's name. It really doesn't matter what she says. She knows where Ronda is. The UFC is ready. You know, Dana, everybody's ready to sign her. And, you know, even though Ronda is the best in the world, we don't even need her in a way. You know, she, she just talks for no reason. You know, don't talk. You know, make, make the division. Come to the UFC and... We're ready to fight. Ronda's ready to fight. Ronda, doesn't matter who it is. Ronda loves challenges. She went back to back with her knee against, you know, she had to do um, operator knee. She still fought with a knee like that with Sarah McMahon. Nobody beat at that time, you know. Good wrestler, um, silver medalist, and stopped her with a body shot. The, Ronda's, Ronda loves challenges. So it's not like Ronda's scared. That's just unnecessary talk. Ronda will, would want to fight her tomorrow. If we tell her, Ronda, you're fighting tomorrow, you know, mm -hmm. she's making the weight. Ronda will make the weight definitely within a day. 100% Ronda will make the weight in one day. She's done it before. You know, at the Ultimate Fighter House, Ronda made weight in one day. She lost all that weight, 20 pounds more, I would say, in one day. So Ronda will fight her tomorrow. It's, that's that's 100% a, that's a fact. I know my fighter. I see my fighter. We can't lie about things like this because if we lie, we can't be true to ourselves when we train. And when I talk about Ronda, everything is a fact. Everything is true. Why? Because if it's not true, then she can't she can't fight at that level because that means it's not pure. When you fight at that level and you fight that great, you have to be loyal and true when you're training. You have to understand what you have, what your fighter has. What your trainer has is 100% committed to you. 100% what's the best for you. And that's my fighter. Ronda is ready to fight Cyborg. Any given day, Ronda will demolish Cyborg also. And just, you know, one more thing, you know, in terms of the matchup, a lot of people looking at it as obviously Cyborg's got these crazy knockouts, she's got this striking experience, Ronda with a judo and a striking game coming up. You know, do you think that st Cyborg's striking would actually be a factor in the fight? Do you think that Ronda Rousey could outstrike Cyborg, possibly even knock her out? <laughs> no way. No way. No way. No way. Ronda beats Cyborg any given day in striking. Any given day. The cyborg fought a Muay Thai girl, you know, and we have a uh, coach trained with her too. We, we know her. She she got dropped with a push kick, you know, on her face. And no way, you know, Ronda started start with the best female Muay Thai champion in United States, you know. They, they know Ronda is the best of all of them. It's not only the best. 14 ounce gloves, they most of the time um, they're on the floor and then getting up, you know. In no way, it's run is too good for a moderator. Yes, certainly. And it, 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 if it ever does happen, um, it will be an exciting one. Last question about the Ronda matchups. Gina Carano, that was a fight that was supposed to sort of come together at one point. Were you disappointed at all that that fight didn't materialize? It would have been a great fight for both girls. Yeah, of course. Any 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 fight, you know, Gina you know, has a lot of kickboxing experience. She's cool, you know. Um, and it, it would have been fun, of course, you know, any fight out there uh, that's exciting for the fans to watch. I'm always uh, with it. And, you know, honestly, Gina Carano has, you know, good striking and, you know, she's fluid. You know, she's not that uh, stiff and like a robot like Cyborg. Cyborg is a robot. Ronda will demolish her. So Gina, it would be a better challenge, I believe. And... As a trainer, I know what I'm talking about, and I know my fighters. So I was excited for that. I thought I was like, good, we'll prepare well, you know, Ronda. 
will will still you know beat her no doubt but it was a good challenge and you know if it happens one day it happens if not you know i'm okay with it she's, she's doing a lot of other things and um, i want the best for her uh, Edmund, we're just we're about to wrap up the interview. Before we do, we just got a couple of fan questions. When he told the fans you're coming on the show, they sent in a couple of questions. Okay. One of them is called uh, the gentleman's name is oh, I think it's a gentleman One Tap. His question is: As one of the best boxing trainers in the world, I'd love to hear Edmund's prediction on who's winning between Mayweather and Pacquiao. What are your thoughts, Edmund? Who's winning this one? Yeah, oh, that's a great question because uh, Pacquiao is you know I've I've trained at, well, I've trained took my fighters and I trained at trained them out of wild card for 12 years. So when Pacquiao came down, um, sparred Art Simonian, one of my fighters that I, I helped. I was an assistant trainer for him. Actually, John Bay was his coach, and he, he's a good friend of mine, great friend of mine. And um, he fought Israel Vasquez for the world title. So we sparred a lot with Pacquiao in those days, in 2000, you know, 2001, 2002. And uh, I know Pacquiao very well. And uh, Freddie, of course. And... Mm. Uh, Mayweather, Pacquiao, Mayweather, everybody knows is the best counter puncher in the world. And he's very intelligent. He's not, again, he's not the quickest and he's not the strongest. He's the smartest fighter in the world. Definitely he is. You know, he, he knows how to win. If Mayweather needs to come forward, I'll guarantee you guys he'll come forward. If he sees he's going back against the rope, he's down three rounds, guess what? Four, five, six, seven, eight, he might come forward. You know, he's a calculated fighter. So, with that said, it's very important we, we look at facts. You know, he's a great counterpuncher. Marquez gave Pacquiao problems because of his counterpunching, right? But Marquez throws a lot of punches himself. Mayweather doesn't. So if he throws less and Pacquiao throws a lot of punches and Mayweather does not catch him, hurt him, you know, and his defense is not as sharp. He's, you know, a little bit uh, too much thinking about defense and not letting his hands go the way he's supposed to. Pacquiao throws a lot of punches. He's quick. He's explosive. He's amazing. As long as he doesn't jump in, he'll be fine. I'll say it's a 50-50 fight. Whoever balances the war well will get the win. And I'm I'm always rooting for my boy Manny. Manny Pacquiao deserves it, and I think he, he could get that win. You know, he's yeah. training very hard, and I'm actually going to go down with Ron to watch one of his training sparring sessions. Freddie, Freddie invited us and said that one of you guys coming down last week, and I said we'll come down when Rodney comes down from Brazil. So we're going to be out there supporting him and watching him, and he's amazing. I, I will, you know, I'm just thinking as as a trainer and, you know, what I could give, that's the best advice. Whoever does it right is going to be victorious, and I'm always with Pacquiao, though. Yeah, it's going to be such a special moment in the history of boxing. Final fan question before we let you go, Edmund. This username is the KO Artist. He'd just like to know, um, and since we are speaking about some of the best boxers in the world, he's he's wondering if Ronda Rousey ever fought Leela Ali in an exhibition fight for the fans, do you think she'd be able to keep up with Leila in the boxing department? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. You know, from Australia, Billy was saying those guys, you know, Billy did, and uh, they're, they're, they were in the gym, you know, and he's one of the great trainers in Australia, right? We know yep. that. And um, he was in the gym. Jeff's been in the gym. You know, I trained Victor Chinian, of course. And they've all seen it. She she boxes amazingly. Holly Holmes, no problem. It's not a problem, not at all. You know, I know she's a bigger girl, but this is a matter of Rama could, could fight anybody. Rama averages 120 punches per round when she boxes. Wow. 120 punches, and everybody knows those punches are going to land. She's she's going to attack. She's going to Those punches are going to touch. If it doesn't touch, if out of 80 of those 100 punches do not touch, I guarantee you Ronda will be crying within the, in between the rounds all day. Everybody knows that. She'll cry all day. So Ronda is amazing. Of course, she can fight all the homes. These girls, these girls haven't seen a special fighter like that. You know that that's done so much for this sport, and everybody's watching it because of how exciting and how great she is. Well, we're always amazed by Ronda's dedication, and of course, behind every great fighter, there's always a great coach. Always appreciate having you on the show, Edmund. Uh, thank you so much for coming on the show, and of course, guys, check out Edmund's gym, Glendale Fight Club. Thank you very much for having me on, guys. Thanks a lot.
And there you guys have it, another big show with four amazing guests and a one-year anniversary. What better way to do it all? Now, before we let you guys go, we do have some stuff to talk about, most notably UFC Fight Night 62, which happened in Brazil just recently. Cass, it, was, it wasn't a stack card, but there were some solid performances throughout it. Yeah, the general consensus was that this card was a lot better than it was on paper. Obviously, originally it was going to be Uriah Faber versus Rafael Sunsau. That was going to be a very interesting fight that was going to main event. It obviously fell out. Demi Meyer and Ryan Flair... Ref- Ryan LaFleur were pushed up to the main event. Mm-hmm. Not not the kind of main event that you would normally see. I mean, people talk about watered-down cards, and I think this is honestly a great example of that. Uh, the event turned out pretty, pretty decent. I want to talk about a few fights. Getting straight into it, the first one I want to talk about, to not many people's surprise, Leonardo Silva against Drew Dober. Uh, this is by far the most controversial fight of the night. You had Drew Dober um, in and Silva, obviously, in a really exciting... Well, it, it was a fun fight. I was really enjoying it. Um, there was a bit of a scramble. Silva went for a guillotine. You know, he dropped down, went for that guillotine. Drew Dober was in, I believe, half guard and no threat whatsoever uh, with that submission. I mean, he was on the correct side. He was literally getting out of it and the referee... I just want to check his name. The referee, uh, I believe his name was Eduardo Hurdy, stopped the fight with no apparent tap. And when I say apparent, I mean there was no tap whatsoever. Many are calling this the worst referee decision in the history of UFC. Dennis, I want to get your thoughts. What do you think about this ridiculous blunder that ended an otherwise exciting fight? Yeah, it's just disgraceful. You know, a lot of referees make a lot of decisions and... In those situations, you can forgive them for a lot of the situations and decisions that they sort of make. But with this one, it was just mind-blowing. How could he stop a fight in that circumstance? I don't know how he was refereeing the fight in the first place, how he got authorized to do so. I'm not sure who authorized him, how it all works. But if anything, it sort of adds to that whole thing of fighters not wanting to go to Brazil and fight because Mm. a lot of the stuff is sort of just managed by the UFC. They don't have a lot of the commissions and a lot of the stuff isn't as developed as the US or even Australia. It was a terrible, terrible stoppage by a referee who really, you know, just doesn't know the sport very well at all doesn't know anything about grappling and i mean for god's sake it's brazil everybody should have some sort of understand understanding of brazilian jiu-jitsu and it was just it was absolutely strange and i felt really really bad for doba because you know you, you fly all the way to brazil and that happens to he was really really not he was a really nice guy in the post-fight speech if that happened to me i'll tell you what i'd be a lot angrier I mean, Dana White did, I believe, give him his bonus. Um, he paid him the money. But at the same time, I mean, it's a, such a tough decision and such, such a tough time for a guy like Dober. And who knows? I don't know if they'll do a rematch or if they'll overturn that decision, but it was just unbelievable. What about you, Cass? You're watching the fight. You're enjoying it. No doubt having some kind of delicious snack and you see something like this happen. What do you do with your snack? Do you put it down? Do you get get angry? What did you think? Well, you know what? This one, I was actually really out of today. I had no snacks, no beverages, no tasty Uh, treats. No tasty treats. I know. I know. I know, right? TMZ (laughs) are going to be all over this. Who who would have thought? But you know what? If I was drinking something, I would have spat my drink out. And if I was eating something, I don't know, chocolates, what I do in in the mornings or whatever. Actually, (laughs) afternoon. (laughs) Yeah, no, you're right. (laughs) When you you wake up late, it feels like the morning. Um, I would have thrown it at the wall. I mean, this is just ridiculous and you know i think everyone can sort of relate to people at their jobs wherever you've worked there's always that one or a few people that just don't do their job right and everybody has to work harder and i think with refereeing it's one of those things where there's there's not really any room for that you can't you can't be a referee if that's the way you're going to referee fights and like you said drew doba coming in obviously from the states to fight and you know lately I think I think we sort of get desensitized to the fact that these guys train so long and so hard and usually years and years and years are put into these kind of, you know, to get into this point, to get into fighting into the UFC. And, uh, you know, because there's so many cards, sometimes they just think, oh, you know, that was a shit fight or a good fight or whatever. But, you know, when you think about the training camp and all the work mm. and, you know, the money and the, and the mm. bills and expenses, and medicals, all that kind of stuff, you know, saying goodbye to your family for a period of time. And then you go there and this idiot referee just makes this ridiculous mistake. And, you know, word on the street is apparently Eduardo Hurdy is a Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu black belt. 
I mean, that's wow. just what I've heard. I, you know, we're literally doing the show basically right after after the event. So I haven't had the time to double check if that's correct or not. But if he is, then that that is it's just really bizarre. just. Well, bizarre. yeah, and also, like, I mean, that's a little bit suspicious. Like, if you're a Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu black belt and you don't understand that he's likely not going to finish the choke from, you know, on the bottom on a half guard, that's just ridiculous. And, yeah. you know, there is that part of me, you know, I feel bad for the refs because it's a really tough job. I wouldn't be able to do it. Um, I don't like thinking on my feet. I think it's very, very stressful. But this is just ridiculous, man. Like, open your eyes. And not only that, but you've got two bad decisions. Obviously, earlier in the fight, for anyone who watched the early fight pass prelims, you know, Christos Gargos, when he defeated Jorge de Oliveira versus, uh, sort of via that rear naked choke, I mean, Herdy was really, really late to stop that. He was obviously tapping early, and he almost went out due to Herdy's incompetence. So, you know, I really, I don't want to be too hard on the guy, but he's an idiot, to be honest. <laughs> yeah, that's and, it. And rightfully so, Dana White's giving Doba his win bonus, and uh, he's suggesting that that should be turned to a no contest. And, you know, between you and I, I don't think it's going to be overturned because we've seen, you know, previously with Uriah Faber, how he finished um, Francisco Rivera, you know, right after that eye poke, and they didn't change it. It's very rare that these fights get changed to no contest, but I really hope this one does. Yeah, they've got to get Herb Dean and Big John McCarthy in there, I don't know, to do some kind of course with every referee, or there just needs to be some kind of process in Brazil where they can weed out the sort of dodgy lemon referees and send mm. them off to wherever they belong. Because yeah. Yeah. And I could see what happened. In the first fight that he did, he let the choke go on for too long, so now he's worried, oh, I don't want this choke to go on for too long, and then he stopped it way too early. You can't have a guy like that that's so easily influenced by people's commentary. You have to have someone who's really strong mentally. It's a mental game, being an MMA referee, and it's so different to being a referee than it, like in tennis or basketball or soccer because if you do make mistakes, people get hurt. So it's probably one of the most important refereeing jobs in any sport, I'd say. So you got, it's tough. You've got to find the right people for it. Well, Josh Rosenthal, you know, he's out of jail. He's out. He's a free man. I mean, that's, <laughs> I'm serious. Let's get Josh Rosenthal down to, down to Brazil or, you know, get him back in the refereeing game. And, uh, you know, because he, he was a good ref. I'd like to see Josh Rosenthal back, regardless of what anyone is opinion of, of you know, Josh. But anyway, yeah. let's, let's talk about the next fight. Uh, I want to talk about... Gilbert Burns versus Alex Oliveira. We're, talk, we're, we're jumping up to the main card. Gilbert Burns is a guy that had a lot, a lot of hype. Obviously, trains with the Black Zillions. Uh, this guy was, or sorry, still is undefeated. And he was originally going to be facing Josh Thompson in this fight. And, you know, and when I, when I originally saw this, I thought, wow, that's a drop down for Josh Thompson. But this guy was meant to be all that in a bag of chips. And I really don't think he impressed <laughs> in this fight. You saw Henry Hooft. Uh, we've had him on the show before, you know, really good guy, does not mince words, and he was scaring everybody in the corner, you know, with uh, with his very direct, you know, what are you doing? What are you doing, Gilbert? Really unimpressed by, by his fight, and I don't know, I don't know whether, it was, whether it was the jitters or what exactly happened, but I'll tell you what, for a guy who they were saying he's world-class ground game, and he does, you know, he's got very, very, very good jiu-jitsu background, you know, he won gold at the World Jiu-Jitsu Championship in 2011, he won gold in the No Gi World Jiu-Jitsu Championship in 2010-13, and I'll tell you what, man, he won by the, the hair in his whiskers, you know, late in the round and got that armbar. What did you think of that fight, Dennis? Yeah, Cass, some great points made. You know, Henry Hooft, he was on the show a few weeks back, great guest, great trainer, someone who's been in the sport for a really long time, did a great job with Burns in his corner, a lot of really direct and well-said directions in his corner, was really impressed with that. I, I really enjoy when a corner man does a good job. Um, of course, later on in the main event, we'll talk about what he said to LaFleur, but yeah, I thought he was doing a good job from a trainer's perspective. From a trainer's perspective, I think he did really well. And, you know, I think it must have been a very frustrating night in general for Henry Hoof. But, you know, I'll tell you what, if Gilbert Burns wants to be a contender or really move up in the ultra, ultra stacked lightweight division in the UFC, you know, he's got he's to be a little bit more... He's got to be a little bit better at implementing his game plan because like Henry Hooft said, he said, you're not doing anything of what you did in training. And Alex Oliveira, you know, the cowboy, he was very, very close to, like his corner said, he said, you know, one more round and then you're going to show the world who you are. And I mean, upsets happen all the time, but I really think Gilbert Burns was the much better fighter in this case. I just don't think he showed it. Let's talk about the next fight. Women's bantamweight, Amanda Nunes, the Lioness, uh, Shayna Baszler. Dennis, I want to get your thoughts on this fight. 
Well, Castle, Baszler has done so much in women's MMA. Um, unfortunately, she's had three losses in a row now. The last fight that she won was in 2012, and she did win most of the fights by submission. Baszler is a real legend in women's MMA. She's done so much for the sport. Unfortunately, with, this, with women's MMA becoming more and more popular and being a part of UFC, there's just more well-rounded athletes. And while Baszler went around and beat a lot of girls with her grappling skills, she really neglected her striking over her career. Now she's 34, and well, with all these fights under her belt, as people know with fighters that have a sort of set in their ways, it's very difficult to advance certain parts of your game when you're used to just focusing on one particular game plan. And her striking is very, very bad. It's very telegraphed, slow. She doesn't have many kick combinations. And her guard lets through a lot of punches. Um, in saying that, I just was not impressed with her whatsoever. Amanda Nunes, on the other hand, she's a rabid dog in the octagon. She's had four great performances, although she did lose to Kat Zingano, who's a very tough opponent. She had three wins and three brutal stoppages um, in the UFC. If I'm in the UFC, I'll keep, her, I'll keep growing her. She could be a big name in women's MMA. I like her style. I like the way she goes in there and finishes girls. And because of the whole Brazil thing, I think she could be a big star in the country. What did you think, Cass? Yeah, no, I really like Amanda Nunes. And obviously, she gave Kat Zagano a lot of trouble in their last fight. As far as Shayna Baszler goes, you know, let me just preface everything I'm about to say with the fact that I really respect Shayna Baszler. She really is a pioneer. And I think with women's MMA, there's obviously a lot less history. So you're seeing legends like Shayna Baszler still sticking around. You know, she's almost like a, kind of like a Matt Hughes in the sense that Matt Hughes is around once the sport evolved. In this case, I think Shayna Baszler, age is catching up with her. And obviously the evolution of the game, she's never had amazing striking. That's never been her strength. She's always been really good at getting opponents down to the ground and submitting them. And I read an interview with her not too long ago where she was talking about how she's not really focusing on striking and, and being well-rounded. She wants to further hone the skills that she already has, which is quote-unquote taking bitches down and submitting them. Or might have been taking girls down and submitted bitches. Anyway, that's what she's been working on. Obviously, you've seen Josh Barnett uh, with her. He's mm. been in her corner. Unfortunately, her UFC run thus far has been very, very underwhelming. Obviously, she lost against Juliana Pena. I believe it was the first fight in the Ultimate Fighter house on the Ultimate Fighter Season 18. She was coming into the UFC and the Ultimate Fighter on a loss against Alexis Davis. And thus far, her official UFC fights have both been... Not only losses, but rather unimpressive ones. Mm -hmm. Betch Cahaya really had a way with her. And Amanda New Year's pretty much the same, but she did it even quicker. Literally a whole round quicker. And getting getting dropped by, uh, you know, a leg kick to the knee, it's not something that you see very often. It's actually not something that you really see ever. Not at this level of the game. And I think if Shayna Baszler does want to continue to be competitive, she's really going to have to work on her striking and make that a threat. Because at the end of the day, you find Shayna Baszler, okay, she's a dangerous opponent. But kind of like a Damian Maya, you know what she's going to do. She's going to try and take you down and she's going to try and submit you. So knowing that, you want to keep the distance, you want to kick away those legs, you want to basically stay at range and pick her apart. And that's pretty much what's happened in two different fights, you know, just just recently. So she's, she's on three in a row losses. Uh, one of them obviously was in Invicta. So I don't know if the UFC will count that. But then again, if you want to include a fight against Juliana Pena, that kind of makes it four losses in a row, mm. even though that was technically an exhibition fight. So I'm, I'm very curious to see if the UFC will keep her around. Because one, one thing that she had, she had obviously the history and she had a name factor. But at the point, at this point, I think that name factor is slowly wearing thin. And I don't know how excited people are going to be to see Shayna Baszler fight again. Again, I, I want to say how you know much I respect Shayna Baszler. But I'll be very curious to see if A, the UFC keeps her around, or B, if she continues fighting in the sport. Yeah, you know, and the statement that you read out that she said to me is just idiotic. At the end of the day, MMA is about you know, advancing all of your skills, and it's just the wrong mindset. If I was Baszler and I had one more fight left in the UFC, if they gave me another opportunity, I would just focus on striking that whole time because she really has a lot of striking that she needs to learn, a lot of movement. She needs to get used to getting hit, the guard, everything. And I just think it's the wrong mentality. Obviously, you have this great skill in being a great submission artist. That's really good. But why aren't you working on your striking? That's what you should be doing, become more well-rounded. MMA 
MMA is, is for athletes that work on all skills, and I'd like to see Baszler work on all, all her skills. Also, the other thing with her is, even though she's a great grappler, she's not overwhelmingly huge for the division. She doesn't have a lot of muscle on her. Um, so she just can't, she can't muscle girls around into submissions and takedowns. Uh, she's not like a Brock Lesnar that could just steamroll through somebody and throw them down on the ground. So I'd really like to see Baszler change her opinion and really work on her striking and just focus on the striking if she wants to keep fighting in MMA. Because even if she did get these wins once in a while where she submits girls, it's that, that's sort of, I don't want to say it's not real MMA, but that's just sort of focusing on one aspect of, of MMA. I think the real greats, I mean, Shayna's great, but the real greats, they want to be great in all areas and win in all areas. And that's what I want to see from Baszler in the future. Yeah, that's true. And at the, this level of MMA, the window for one-dimensional fighters is really, really closing. I mean, you can still you can still get away with it to a degree, but once you move up higher, and Amanda Nunez, she's really top of the division, yeah. that window is really closing. And the yeah. other thing is, like, you take a guy like Josh Barnett, who obviously is, you know, a very close trainer of hers, there's a little bit more room for a guy like Josh Barnett because she, to do to implement that kind of game plan of taking people down and you know smothering him because he's a big heavyweight and obviously in the heavyweight division the the weight limit is so so varied. I think the minimum is what two hundred and twenty pounds or technically two hundred six mm -hmm. to two sixty five. So there's room for guys that are a lot bigger with Shayna Baszler. I mean in in the bantamweight division you just can't really have that. So like you know like I said two really underwhelming performances very curious to see what happens with Shayna Baszler next if she hangs it up or if the UFC cut her and if if that happens will she continue to fight because obviously she's fought and clawed her way to get to where she is now and I just I'm wondering you know will she continue to you know she's been doing this for years and years and years and years and finally you get to a company like the UFC where you get paid better and obviously you have certain privileges that you don't get in the indies will she want to continue if she's you know out so uh, you know as, as quickly as she got in yeah and ronda rousey her friend is a great example of someone who was uh, an amazing grappler that took striking very very seriously and now mm. edmund was talking to us just before saying that he believes she could beat Layla ali in a boxing match i mean we know how hard ronda rousey works on all aspects of a game to be the best and i just think Shayna baszler she knows what it's like to be the best she should have a different sort of outlook on the whole MMA game. And I'd like to see a change her opinion and really work on her striking. Let's jump to the next fight. Lightweight, Leonardo Santos against Tony Martin. You know, Dennis, you and I were chatting about this one before. What did you think of the fight? Well, Leonardo Santos is now a name that I'm more familiar with. I think it's because the UFC have really grown his name through all the Brazilian fights that he's won. Um, he's won all of his fights in the, Uf in the UFC except for a no contest in Norman Park. Beating tough guys like veteran Efren Escudero and another great win. Uh, the, today, especially beating Martin on the ground, an area where he's no slouching. I'm actually really excited about Leonardo Santos. I think he could be a great name for the Brazilian fans. Obviously, a lot of the U.S. fans, if they don't watch the Brazilian cars, they may not be that familiar with him, but he's a very, very tough guy. He's very well balanced in every area of MMA, and I'm really interested in seeing who they'll match Santos up with next. It was another great performance by Santos, and I, I just think he, he may be a big star in the future if he keeps improving. I think the UFC may have a good name in, on their hands for the Brazilian cards, but I'd also like to see him venture off the Brazilian cards into more pay-per-views if he gets a couple more wins because he may very well be one of the top guys in the future. It's interesting you say that. You know, I think Leonardo is a really good name to have on these Brazilian cards because obviously the the Brazilians know him a lot better than we do, even mm -hmm. though he's already had four fights in the UFC. He's one of those like shoe ins that the Brazilians will love, and if you put him on a Brazilian card, you know they'll they'll be a lot more excited than say we will. You know, kind of like ha like with Anthony Parosh. Like we love Anthony Parosh, and all the Aussies will come out to see Anthony Parosh. But if you put him in, I don't know, Dallas, Texas, the Americans obviously won't be as excited to see. Him. So look, I'm I'm enjoying to see him develop and, and grow as a fighter. That that trip that he hit, absolutely beautiful trip. Uh, obviously, Dennis and myself, you know, we did Sambo for a, not a very long period of time, and it weren't very good <laughs> at all. But we can still appreciate it. Very very nice trip. Uh, really takes us back to our you know short roots. Our and, days being tripped over ourselves. Yeah, getting killed by guys <laughs> like fifty kilos, yeah. you know, heavier than us. Yeah. Um, and yeah, obviously a really nice rear naked choke. He's got a great Brazilian jiu-jitsu background. So 
Very impressed with Leonardo. Let's talk about the next fight, the welterweights, because we are running a bit low on time. Eric Silva, Josh Koscheck. You know, Josh Koscheck obviously had a very, very quick turnaround. He was last choked out by Jake Ellenberger um, in a far from impressive performance. It was actually a highlight reel finish, and Josh Koscheck was on the losing end of that one. What did you think of this fight, Dennis? You know what? I thought Josh Goscheck made a huge mistake by taking this fight in such short notice. I guess the, his theory behind it was he was already in shape and he just wanted to get in there and show people what he was made of. And at the start of the fight, Josh Koscheck probably has looked better than he has in a lot of fights. He was in there. He came out strong, looking to land that right hand. And he looked, he looked pretty impressive. Um, Eric Silva wrestled around with him there. He looked good there as well. But unfortunately, after Eric landed some strong strikes, he froze up yet again. That's the, the problem with Josh Koscheck. Um, after you land some strong strikes in him these days, he'll freeze up and he'll start doing this thing with his nose like he's a rabbit from a, uh, from a Warner Brothers movie where he's, he's moving it back and forth. You know he's frozen up when he's doing that. Um, a lot of people will say that Josh has taken a lot of abuse to the face over the years, which he has, and it's all a physical issue as well. But to me, after speaking with Edmund and talking about Jake Ellenberger, I'd like to also say that I think it's a, uh, a psychological issue with him. I think it's a mental thing with him. I think after getting hit, he just sort of freaks out a little bit and freezes up. And after all these losses back to back to back, he just has so much to lose that he's just not the same fighter. I'd love to see him work with a psychologist before his next fight and really figure out all these kinks to start getting back on track. Guys like GSP, all the big winners, tell us later, spoke to us about this. Sports psychologists do a huge amount for athletes. And I think if Josh Koscheck wants to keep fighting, and I'm not sure because they didn't do a post-fight speech with him, which was weird. I guess mm. maybe he got out of the octagon. But it um, doesn't matter because I had all those post-fight speeches in the Brazil card. It's, it's just so hard to watch. Mm. But um, if he does plan on fighting again, he needs to focus on his mental game. Because physically, he was in great shape. He came out strong. But after he got hit a few times, he just froze up. Now, Eric Silva, he may have boyish good looks, but he's 30. So he's back on a two-fight win streak. He should, uh, I think he should have really beaten Matt Brown in their fight. Who knows where he'd be now if he did. But he's got another big name win on his record. Let's see where he takes it from here. I mean, I'm not I'm not going to say this is his last run. He's got plenty of runs left in him. But he does freeze up when he versus some of the bigger names. He lost against John Fitch. When they throw another big name at him, let's see how he goes. Because he, he has a lot of potential, but he has he has sort of frozen up when he went up against the top and had a shot to move up that ladder. So we'll see what happens with him now. Cass, you see Josh Koscheck is versing Eric Silva. He takes that fight. What do you think? Who do you think wins it? Look, at the end of the day, only Josh Koscheck knew how he was feeling. Josh Koscheck's one of those guys, he's always in shape. Obviously, he had a long layoff, but when he was fighting consistently and when he was at the top of his game, he was always, always in shape. You know, very much like a company man, he would always take fights because mm. he was just always in the gym. So, you know, I think... I'm like, I'm the type of guy like, and I can only liken this to when I play video games, all right? When I'm playing mm -hmm. against someone or, or whatever against the computer and I lose. What, what, are you, what are you playing here? Give us, give us a visual here. Well, all right, let's say Call of Duty, all right? Okay. And I'm kind of over first person shooter, but let's say you play you, Call of Duty. You're not a big Call of Duty guy, just in case someone's I'm listening not. right now and they turn off the show because they think we're Call of Duty guys. <laughs> we're not. We're not Call I'm of not. Duty guys. I'm really okay. over first person shooters. Yeah. But I, yeah. there was a point where I did, right? You get shot, okay. you're playing online, and you, yeah. pre you, got, you press the button to respawn. I'm the type of guy who's like hammering that respawn button as soon as like my guys drop into the ground because <laughs> I just want to erase all memory of you know you know yeah. that getting shot getting you know whatever losing and i want to get straight back in there and i think it's kind of like that with josh koscheck you know he had a win he had sorry he had a loss and he said it was a stupid mistake and it could be a case of you know the 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 instincts the triggers they weren't firing because of that uh, because of that long layoff, and maybe Josh Koscheck believe you know what put me back in there I won't make that same mistake again and other than that other than that you know beautiful finish that loss you know, I feel good. Maybe that's what Josh Koscheck was thinking. And realistically, like, he didn't take a huge amount of damage in that fight. He got submitted. He got choked out. It's not like he got, you know, knock, knocked out. No. So I think he felt good going to that fight. And, you know, we saw we saw a good Josh Koscheck. He came out. He was pressuring Eric Silva. He was throwing that overhand right. Uh, he didn't really do too much to set it up. And he was obviously falling off balance, which to me wasn't a good sign. But then I thought, look, maybe he's just trying to pressure Eric Silva. Maybe he wants to make Eric Silva crumble. And uh, unfortunately, 
right at the very end of the first round, Eric Silva capitalized and he got that guillotine choke. And, you know, you saw Josh Koscheck, he it was up against the cage and Josh put that other arm in to make it an arm in guillotine. And I thought, you know, brilliant veteran move. I really didn't think he was going to get finished. I thought Josh looks calm. I don't, I wouldn't be worried about this. And then uh, he gave the really faint tap and I was like, shit, dude. That's two really bad submissions in a row. And Josh Koscheck's a guy. He didn't really get mm. submitted prior to these last mm. couple of fights, you know? Like yeah. Anthony Rumble John Johnson, he's a guy that, you know, had his fair share. And you have those guys that are just susceptible to, you know, rear naked chokes and submissions. And Josh Koscheck just wasn't one of those guys. So... Eric Silva, talking about him a little bit, the story with him, basically, he came into the UFC with so much hype. And Anderson Silva once said, when they said, who's the man to take over you when you retire, Anderson? He said, Eric Silva, he's the man who will carry on my legacy. He's the, he's my protege. He is the next man in line. And obviously, if you follow his UFC career, it hasn't really been the smoothest for Eric Silva at all. And uh, man, he, he looks bloody young. I'll tell you what, the fact that you said he's 30, I would have expected him to be much younger. And he, I still believe leave he's got a lot of room to grow i don't think he's hit his prime yet at all i think he's still evolving and the best eric silver yet could be in the future i will just say the difference between eric silver and anderson silver is anderson silver was already a fantastic striker uh and he just unfortunately in his early career didn't really have the wrestling he didn't really have the brazilian jiu-jitsu and that's why he was losing eric silver is already a more complete fighter i think he's very explosive and he's got some you know really good attributes but we've seen him take some losses that really really derailed him so i'm hoping to see you know eric silver tighten up his game he looked good against josh koshik he's got a legend on his resume now I'm very curious to see who they match him up with next yeah and the other thing i wanted to point out was i'm not sure exactly who josh trains with now i mean his wikipedia page says the dethroned base camp so he must bring guys in to work with yeah. but um people will remember that he was a big part of aka and they parted ways and had some things to say about each other but i would say that uh when he was an aka he was a bit of a different fighter i suppose that when you're working out with people who are best of the best and you have these crazy trainers around you who are just so knowledgeable it's a different thing um i don't know it's just it just doesn't seem like we're seeing the same josh koscheck as we used to and the other thing people don't may not realize is he's actually 37 years old wow i, I mean that's that's pretty old for a guy that's been fighting for such a long time we'll see what the ufc decides to do with him if he does retire i'm a little bit salty that we didn't get an opportunity to say see him say goodbye in the octagon but mm. then again he's in brazil and People don't really care. And you got that translator loosely translating what you're saying. So I understand it all. We'll see what happens. What do you think? You're the UFC cast. Do you push him out? Or he's done so much for the sport. Do you let him keep fighting? Yeah, I think these guys from the first Ultimate Fighter, they help build the UFC in a lot of ways. And I think mm. you give them a little bit more leeway. I mean, you know, he's he's on a bad skid. I'm just having a look. Holy crap. I didn't even realize it. He's on five losses in yeah. a row. Yeah. Five rough losses. Well, four rough losses out the of those only, ones. The only thing I will say, though, right? I'd yep. say getting submitted is better than getting knocked out because then you have sure. that whole, man, you're taking brain damage. So if you do give him... Look, I, I, Josh Koscheck's never going to be the champion. It's just not going to happen. I, unless by some crazy miracle. But if you give him maybe a lower level opponent, I don't know who who to match him up with. I mean, the division is is stacked. This this they can find somebody. You know what I mean? Give him one more fight, possibly in the MGM Grand. And if he does lose, at least he has a chance to say goodbye in front of the crowd. We'll see. Mm. I, I I don't think that Dana White's going to give him the retirement talk just because you know he hasn't he hasn't that had that many KO losses in his career. I mean, really, he's only had a handful. Um, there isn't you know as much of a fear of brain damage. And even in this fight, like he didn't take a huge amount of punishment. It's not like oh. He got dropped a bunch of times, and then he got submitted. I mean, he took a couple of bad shots, and that's pretty much it. He he seems to me like a smart guy. He seems like a guy that when he retires, he's going to have pretty much most of his brain cells intact. So I think give him one more fight, maybe give him someone favorable. Um, and if he does lose, make it in the MGM Grand, and he can say goodbye to a you know to a Vegas crowd. And just before you know, to also mention, I did see Crazy Bob Cook in his corner, so. I know Crazy Bob Cook is obviously one of the guys he trains with. I feel really bad for Josh Koscheck. Yeah. 
Let's, and you know, the, sorry, go on, Cass. No, I was gonna, I was gonna talk about the next fight. Yeah, go on. What were we gonna say? Yeah, be, uh, before we get off the topic, just for everybody who's listening, who's sort of gotten into the sport recently, don't think that that's what Josh Koscheck is like. He was actually one of the best pound for pound fighters in welterweight division for a really, really long time, hmm. and it's just not the same Josh Koscheck as we, we we were used to seeing back in the day. Back in the day, he was an absolute animal. So mm. I agree with you. Give him one more shot at the MGM Grant. Say goodbye. Mike, much like Mark Munoz is possibly saying goodbye in his next fight. And, and at least give him a nice send-off. Well, he will. I'm pretty sure Mark Munoz said that he will retire after his fight in the Philippines. And I think, yeah, he kind of owes it to these legends. Give him a nice send-off. Kind of like Nagara, how he said he wants Frank Mir and then he'll retire. Let's talk about the next fight because we are running out of time. Damian Meyer versus Ryan R- LaFleur. You know, an interesting main event, but I guess one that makes sense when you're in Brazil. you got Damian Maia with his amazing, amazing Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. And I've heard that, I believe it was Joe Rogan who said that this guy outgrappled Fabrizio Verdum. And then you've got Ryan LaFleur, who obviously is an up, was an up-and-coming guy, was go, was undefeated going into this fight. What is your assessment of the fight, Dennis? What did you think? Ooh, it's a tough one. I have a couple of opinions here. The first opinion is Damian Maia is just so damn good at his Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. He's combined it with his beautiful take with these beautiful takedowns which you you don't usually see from pure jiu-jitsu guys so he's combined a bit of wrestling in there as well if any mma fighters watch a fight i'd say watch this fight and watch damien Maya's position control a lot of the time mma fighters will get into a nice position like side control amount only to lose it very very quickly because they just think submission 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 damien Maya does a great job by keeping position control i was very very uh very very impressed in that fifth round he looked exhausted and it, it wasn't very impressive ryan lafleur obviously did a decent job in the fifth round uh big john mccarthy deducted a point from damien Maya for flopping mm. i would actually a lot of people were against that i was actually in support of that because it looked like damien Maya was deliberately doing that not to stand yeah. And I, I'm happy with Big John's decision. Uh, a lot of people give da- gave Damian May a lot of crap over Twitter about being in man- not being able to finish with a submission. I, I would just give that to Ryan LaFleur for being so damn tough and not giving any submissions up in mount. What people don't realize about mount is you don't have that many submissions to go for. You've got that arm triangle. You can maybe try for an, uh, a triangle choke or an arm bar, but a lot of those moves will leave you in a lot of danger of ending up on your back, possibly with the other person on top of you. I don't think Damian Meyer is the type of guy that would do something like that. Obviously, it was a little bit disheartening to see that he couldn't finish LaFleur from mount could have pro- most guys could could have probably punched the hole in the canvas by then. But at the same time, I was very very impressed with his grappling. Uh, the striking at the end, obviously, he was running away a lot. It wasn't that impressive, but it was a dominant win from Damian Maia. I'm not going to take anything away from him. He did a very very good job, and it was actually a fight that I was very interested in watching as a somebody who's a big fan of grappling. I was just absolutely amazed at how he was able to get into mount every time. One time pulling him into his guard and then ending up on top. It was very, very impressive from that standpoint. But from the standpoint of sort of being in a dominant position and not finishing the fight, I suppose I could see how a lot of people could say that they don't see him beating some of the top guys in the division. I can understand that argument. Nevertheless, still think it was a really good performance from Damian Maya. Cass, what did you think of the fight? I think you covered it really well. And I think Damian's wrestling has really, really improved and become a big factor because you see a lot of guys that are real experts on the ground and have great Brazilian jiu-jitsu but they can't necessarily get it to the ground and you Mm. see that with Mm. BJJ guys and MMA fighters where you know they may have they may be so good once they're on the ground and you know getting the fights to the ground just isn't their forte whether they don't have the judo or the wrestling you know and that's why I think Sambo is so good because you you have the ground game but you also have the trips and things like that um, and Damian Meyer has really, really put it together, and he's looked great in welterweight, um, other than a few, you know, not quite as bef- impressive performances. Obviously, Rory McDonald, that's one that comes to mind. With this one, I thought Ryan Flair was going to take it. I just thought this was a guy that was just putting everything together. Obviously, he's coming in there undefeated. He trains with the Black Zillions. Um, I just thought that he was going to outwork Damian Meyer. And then there was the gas tank of Damian Meyer that hasn't been the greatest. And, you know, we saw it against Rory McDonald where he looked so good in the first round. And then afterwards, Rory just took over. And I, honestly, I thought Ryan's wrestling was going to be enough to stuff the takedowns. Because the thing is about Damian Meyer, and he's a fantastic grappler but he's still one-dimensional. And he's, his boxing has come a long way. If anyone remembers the not 
too distant fight against Chris Weidman. He took Chris Weidman to the distance, and I believe it was a pretty close fight. Chris mm. Weidman, of course, taking that one on very short notice. But nevertheless, Damien Maia, you know, his boxing has come a long way. I saw some decent shots that Maia threw. He had a decent Yeah, some jab. good shots, some he great caught, shots. He yeah. caught Ryan when Ryan was slipping with some, you know, really decent shots. Nothing that's going to, you know, really just knock you out and leave you unconscious on the mat. But still, his boxing is, is efficient and it works. But obviously, his grappling is the main thing he goes for. So I th- And you know what? We spoke to Anthony Parosh about this. Anthony Parosh in Sydney mentioned, and he admitted that he himself is one-dimensional. But the thing is, if you're one-dimensional and people can't stop your game, whose problem is that? And I think it's a similar thing with Damian Meyer. You know he's not going to try and knock you out. He's going to try and take you down. And it's your job to stop that. And unfortunately, Ryan LaFleur failed on that. M- again, much to the frustration of Henry Hooft. The one thing that I want to say uh, with Damian Maya, man, I think this guy, if he could work on his ground and pound and have really brutal ground and pound, that would be a huge asset to his game. Because if he if he gets you on mount, you know, you're worried about that submission, and then boom, he's raining down with, you know, really deadly strikes on top of your face, and then you're probably going to raise an arm up and leave yourself open to mm. an arm bar. I think that's mm. probably the best way to go for Damian Maya because I think that's easy to do and to work on as opposed to becoming a knockout artist, which I don't think is going to happen you know, in Damian Meyer's career. I just don't think he's going to have that one-punch knockout power. So I think deadly ground pound is probably the way for him to go, you know, mix in more elbows in, in you know, in when you're on top and things like that. One thing I want to say, though, is obviously the fifth round, that's when it all came apart from Damian Meyer. He gassed out. He looked very desperate. He's flopping on his back. I didn't realize, Dennis, until you said that a lot of people were against that decision. To take yeah, a lot, a, of, a, lot, a lot of heat on uh, Twitter. A lot of people were a bit anti Big John McCarthy for that one. I thought it was a brilliant, brilliant decision. For I Big think John. people are anti Big John McCarthy anyway, and I don't really understand that because I think Big John McCarthy is. I like Big John's style in the cage. He's very, very dominant, and he sets the rules down. He sets the law down, and that's what a referee is supposed to do. And you see it often in boxing where the referee he looks like he's. I don't know, one day away from retirement. He looks mm-hmm. like he's not even awake. Yeah. And even in MMA, you see the same thing. So I like Big John's style, and I'm yep. really glad that he took away that point. Absolutely, man. Damien Maia was clearly stalling. And I was I was frustrated with Maia in the fifth round. I was like, dude, I know you put in four really good rounds, but you were clearly stalling. Like, you could see the frustration on Ryan LaFleur. <laughs> he's putting his hands up, like, you know, what is he doing? And he's, you know, he was really milking it when Big John was saying, get up, get up. He was really taking his time, you know, not not like not quite at the level of Yal Romero on that stool, but he was really yeah. milking it. Um, the the other thing I was going to say about Damian Meyer, as good as he looked tonight, if I'm Dana White, I probably wouldn't put him in too many main events or five round fights. And the other thing is, as good as he looked tonight, I think he's still a little bit too one dimensional to crack that elite top. You know, I, I think he's ranked number seven actually in the division. But I, I don't know how far he's also going to get because this went against Ryan Flair. It doesn't do much for him. It doesn't put him ahead in the division and the guys up ahead of him. I mean, could you imagine him doing that to Johnny Hendricks? No, he's not, he's not going to, you know, out wrestle Johnny Hendricks like that. And I can't see him doing that to a lot of the guys at the top of the world to eight division. So mm. as impressed as I was with Damian and Maya, I'm just kind of questioning how, how far is he really going to go in this division? Yeah, it's a good question as well. And obviously he mentioned after the fight that he had some sort of infection. So he had a really, really tough Another training one. camp for this one. Yeah. Had a really tough. Tr- he he should look at uh, using some of that Rich Franklin cream. Yeah, um, armor gel. Armor gel. Everybody go get some armor gel. But um, I agree with you. They need to have a look at him. I think if it was a three round fight, we'd see a different performance from Maya. I think he, in the back of his mind, he knew it was a five rounder and knew it was a good a good chance that it would go all five rounds, and he was trying to keep some energy. Uh, very interested to see what they do next and what kind of, what he looks like if he doesn't train with an infection and if that affected him and his cardio. And obviously, if he does want to become champion, bang, you got five round fights every fight. So something for him to think about. One of the things I didn't like, um, I'd like to get your opinion on this as well, Cass, because maybe we've got a different one on it. But I actually didn't like Henry Hooft's uh, cornering style full of flair, especially near the end of that fight. 
I just felt like uh, Hooft was having more of a go at LaFleur than really sort of explaining calmly as to what he should be doing. I'm not sure, though, because with a lot of fighters, you have different approaches. Some fighters do better when you have a go at them. Other fighters do better when you explain stuff calmly. Personally, if I was a fighter and uh, Hooft was saying that to me, it would just frustrate me even more. I'd, I'd prefer having somebody just calmly explain what I should be doing. A lot of what Hooft was telling him wasn't really stuff that he could use. He he did say some interesting stuff about combinations, but I'd want my cornerman really analyzing the round and telling me what I could do. And I, I don't know if it helped LaFleur much during the fight. I mean, in the end, he really did come out after who had his biggest go at him before round five. But I don't know. I just I don't like that kind of cornering style. I don't know. What do you think, Cass? Well, I think different strokes for different folks. And like you said, he did come out and he did have a fire lit under his ass after that last go that Hooft had at him. And I think in between the frustration that Henry Hooft had, you know, he did have a lot of good points on what to do, and he he did give him technical advice on you know throwing one twos and. To me, even with my sort of basic knowledge, obviously I've never been a fighter, but everything that Hooft said, I could understand it, I could grasp it. You know, you sometimes you hear corners and they've got all this crazy code and, you know, throw a sandwich and do this and blah, 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 and mm -hmm. whatever control. And to me, it was very basic and straight to the point. And given, given how much time he had, you know, on the chair in the corner, I feel like... It'd be a different story if all Hooft said was how much he frustrated he was, but he got his frustration out and he gave him the technical advice. So I didn't have an issue with it, and I think it was because obviously he's used to seeing a different Ryan LaFleur in the gym, and he's sort of letting him know, like, hey man, you're not doing what you're supposed to do. And I think sometimes you see corners that are just way too calm and they don't give that sense of urgency. Sometimes you see fighters take that into, you know, the second or third round and they just fight as if, you know, they've got all the time in the world. So at the end of the day, my opinion is only only Henry Hooft and Ryan LaFleur know what kind of relationship they have and Henry Hooft would know what motivates him. So I get your point. I know I know that obviously a lot of guys would be frustrated if someone spoke to them like that, but I didn't I didn't take any issue with it. Um, I yeah, just and I found, I found I, sorry, sorry to cut you off, but I just found it really strange as well. And again, if that's the relationship that works for him, then the, that's great. But no, no one from the grappling department there sitting down with Lafleur, talking through stuff as well. I mean, I, I thought a lot of the stuff that Hoof said was interesting, but some more technique as to how to avoid those takedowns, what to do in those really dodgy situations where he just got mounted every time. I don't know, if I was LaFleur, I'd have a good grappling coach in the ring with me in between rounds as well, having a chat to me. But that's just a personal opinion. I'm sure whatever they do works for them usually. Obviously, he was undefeated before. Yeah, I'm thinking maybe a lot of that technique, they might have already worked on it during training. And maybe it's just a case of Henry Hoofs going, look, you know what to do. You're just not doing it. But... Look, I'm, I think Ryan LaFleur will grow from this. It's his first defeat, and most guys who are undefeated, they do come back really strong. So, you know, he, he's got a lot of good things going for him when we saw glimpses of, I wouldn't call it brilliance, but he looked decent in the fifth round. And one thing I will say, man, he's, he's a battler. He kept going and kept going. I was looking at some of the positions that he was in, and I was sort of looking to see if he would give up, to see if he would leave himself open for a choke. It was one point where Damian Maia had that uh, arm triangle, and uh, you know he was he was really looking to tighten it. And I was like, man, if Ryan Lafleur is not a warrior, he could easily just submit to this and say, oh, you know, he caught me, even though he probably could have fought out of it. And you know, he did fight out of. He gave the thumbs up. He didn't want to quit. And obviously, he did last all five rounds. This is his first time going five rounds. So huge respect to Ryan Lafleur, and I'm very interested to see what happens with Damian Maia in the future and who he gets matched up with. Tell you what, that's a big episode. I think we've got to cut it right there. We've been talking for a while. We've had four amazing guests. Uh, obviously, we've had Jeremy Horn, Ricardo Lamas, Felice Herrig, and Edmund Taverdian. Uh, and believe it or not, in case we didn't already make a big deal out of it before, this is our one-year anniversary. One year of Submission Radio, the 22nd of March to the day. How lucky are we? It's actually crazy that two years in a row, the 22nd of March, falls on the exact same day. But just want to say a big thank you before we wrap it up to, you know, all the fans, all the fans support, you know, everyone who comments on the YouTube channel and who hits us up on Twitter, at Submission AUS, and of course, all the fantastic media that have given us coverage over the last year. We are going anywhere. There's going to be a whole lot more of Submission Radio uh, left, and I would say the best is yet to come. Dennis, any other final words? 
Yeah, you know, a big thank you to you, Cass. Obviously, a year well spent. Uh, very excited for the next year to come. Guys, as always, you can check us out on Twitter at Submission AUS, YouTube.com forward slash Submission Radio AU. And down in the comment section below, let us know what did you think of Damian Meyer's performance? Do you think he can hang in there with the top welterweights and possibly win a title? Do you think it was a case of him having another training camp with an infection and that's what caused him to look a little bit weak in the fifth round? And do you think he's got what it takes to be the next undisputed champion in the welterweight division we love your comments always comment down below if you have any other thoughts on the show felice uh, edmund ricardo or jeremy horn whatever you thought about the interview any questions any thoughts any comments always put them down in the comment section below we love talking to our fans or tweet us at any time and of course just one more thing you know if you are listening on itunes or stitcher give us a review give us how many stars you know you think we deserve let us know we think we're always looking to improve we appreciate the feedback we'll see you next week